full day today, so we want to get started on time. My name is Cecilia Solhoff. I am a press liaison and outreach coordinator for the Wireless Bureau here at the FCC. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Um, we're going to have two panels, uh, we're, with some opening remarks to start us off, and then we're going to have two panels and then some remarks at the end. There will be time in between the pa uh, after each panel for you guys to ask questions. Those sitting here in the audience, we have no cards and pens on the back table where the program and sign-in sheets were. We have FCC staff. All you have to do is just raise your hand to ask for a note card, or when you have your question ready, we'll get them from you. Those who are watching remotely, because we are streaming this live on the web, can send an email to livequestions at FCC.gov, and we'll get your questions that way. Also, we are on Twitter with hashtag FCC Live. If you would like to submit a question, we just ask that you put your name and the company or organization that you're affiliated with along with the question, both here and remotely. So to start us off today, I'd like to introduce Roger Sherman. Roger is the Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau here at the FCC. Good morning. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, as Cecilia said, my name is Roger Sherman, and I'm the Chief of the FCC's Wireless Bureau. It's my job to kick off this joint FCC Department of Labor workshop on tower climber safety. So on behalf of the Commission, I'd like to welcome everyone attending this event in person and all those viewing the workshop over the Internet. As we begin, I want to acknowledge our partners in this effort, many of whom are represented here in the Commission meeting room today. Uh, first, we greatly appreciate the collaborative efforts of staff from OSHA, the Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration, the Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. Equally important has been the assistance of public interest advocates and industry both of which have been open to discussing this issue with us and considering how safety can be improved. Joining us today are representatives from PCIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association, CTIA, the Competitive Carriers Association, as well as the five largest wireless providers and a number of tower companies. Thank you for being with us. I also want to thank Senator Nelson for sending a supportive letter to Chairman Wheeler on this issue. A copy of Senator Nelson's letter is in your program. Last, but certainly not least, I want to acknowledge all of the panelists and moderators who will be discussing these issues with us today. Thank you so much for your participation. We're here today because tower climber safety is an important and pressing issue. Since January of 2013, there have been 24 fatalities related to tower work. These fatalities have occurred across the country and at a rate that is significantly higher than in comparable fields. Given the burgeoning demand for towers and tower work, we're very concerned that the rate of fatalities may increase. The scope of this issue, that is the growing number of towers that climbers maintain, is hard to appreciate. So let me provide a bit of context. Our Office of Engineering and Technology, also known as OET, tracks the deployment of radio communication facilities. And OET now estimates that there are over one million structures and towers on which antennas are installed in the United States. And of those 1 million, uh, over 380,000 structures are at 100 feet or higher and require hands-on work done by technicians. Given the number of sites that require work, the FCC has a keen interest in the safe deployment of these facilities. As everyone who walks on a city street is aware, Americans are increasingly adopting smartphones, streaming more high-definition video on faster networks, and using ever more amounts of mobile data. Cisco projects that mobile data will grow at an annual rate of 50% from 2013 to 2018, while Ericsson, a network infrastructure provider, projects that mobile data growth uh, will be between 45% per year between 2013 and 2019. Obviously, there's a huge explosion in demand for mobile broadband, and to meet this demand, the FCC is preparing to auction off new spectrum licenses facilitate the deployment of new wireless infrastructure and explore new frontiers of spectrum for new wireless services. But there's another side to this work that we do that is not just about consumers or spectrum. For every call that goes through, for every text that's delivered, and for every photo that is successfully shared, there's a tower or other infrastructure transmitting that information from a mobile phone to a network. And almost every one of these tower sites was built and is maintained by those represented in the room here today. Wireless networks require constant adjustments, and as demand for wireless service grows, there's an increasing demand for tower climbers. 
This is especially true as providers race to deploy 4G LTE services and utilize new spectrum, including the spectrum that we plan to start auctioning on November 13th. Tower climbers are needed to install many of the new radios that are deployed, and these radios require maintenance, also by tower climbers. On the cusp of a new wave of major spectrum auctions and in the middle of coordinated efforts to encourage the deployment of broadband facilities, we would be remiss if we did not find time to focus on the safety of tower climbers. We need to take a step back from our constant efforts to make spectrum available and deploy new facilities and make sure that this spectrum rush is moving forward in a manner that pays full attention to the safety of tower climbers. And this is exactly the right time for the FCC to take a close look at tower safety. The Commission is in the midst of a broad and coordinated effort to facilitate the deployment of wireless infrastructure. Along with our commitment to facilitating this rollout, we have an obligation to pay attention to the critical safety issues that the rollout entails. In this regard, we especially appreciate OSHA's leadership on this matter and thank all of our federal partners for the spirit of cooperation they have brought to this initiative. During the past year, FCC staff has spoken with many stakeholders that understand the vital importance of tower climbers and the importance of focusing on safety now. Indeed, the cross-section of public interest groups and industry gathered here today represents some of the most well-informed experts on tower climber safety. In the discussions that will occur this morning, I know there will be many excellent ideas about how industry can enhance safety, and we look forward to this discussion. But one foundational concept that I hope we can all recognize up front is this. Every tower climber death is preventable. There are no inevitable fatalities in this business. Every death is, in fact, the result of a breakdown in a safety system. We need to think creatively, systemically, and comprehensively about how to prevent such breakdowns, and we need to implement solutions without delay. In closing, I want to say I'm confident with the expertise gathered here that this workshop will produce results. And thank you again for joining us today. I'm now pleased to introduce the Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Dr. David Michaels. Dr. Michaels has been a leader on this issue for a long time, and the FCC looks forward to working with him and the team at OSHA to solve this problem. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here for today's workshop, which represents a his historic collaboration between government agencies and all sectors of the wireless industry to discuss tower worker safety. We're here today because we know how dangerous working with communication towers can be and because we all have a role in keeping workers safe. I want to thank FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler and his staff and Secretary of Labor Tom Perez and our staff for their commitment to worker safety. Because of their leadership, some of the industry's most important players are at the table together for the first time to discuss how we can work together to prevent worker injuries and fatalities. We at OSHA are very concerned about the rising number of tower worker deaths. The fatality rate in this industry is extraordinarily high. Tower workers are killed on the job at a rate more than 10 times higher than construction workers. In 2013, OSHA recorded 13 communication tower-related worker deaths, which is nearly double the number of the previous two years combined. And so far in 2014, there have already been 11 worker deaths at communication tower work sites. On January 31st, Ronaldo Edward Smith, a maintenance worker, fell to his death from a communications tower in Cameron County, Texas. The very next day, two cell towers collapsed at a job site in Clarksburg, West Virginia, killing two tower workers, Kyle Kilpatrick and Terry Lee Richard, as well as firefighter Michael Dale Garrett, who was responding to the collapse. In March, two more tower workers, Seth Garner and Martin Powers, died in Blaine, Kansas, when the cell tower they were dismantling collapsed. These are just a few of the tragedies that have occurred this year. Every single one of them could have been prevented. The deaths of these workers cannot be the price we pay for increased wireless communication. OSHA has been focused on improving safety in this industry for some years. We've developed a comprehensive initiative, including outreach to key industry stakeholders, public and media outreach, training, and possible rulemaking. We're developing a request for information to engage all stakeholders, including everyone here today, in a collaborative effort to prevent more of these senseless tragedies. And we want to work with all of you to identify and implement them. 
You can share your stories, concerns, and best practices at OSHAComTower at DOL.gov. Now, where necessary, OSHA also uses tough enforcement and fines to ensure that a strong message is sent to employers who put workers in danger. But because most workers in this industry are assigned to work sites on very short notice and don't stay on site for a very long time, OSHA does not usually know when tower workers are at risk, and we can't schedule inspections that might identify hazards before a worker is hurt or killed. So in addition to enforcement, much of our focus is on outreach and education. In response to the jump in fatalities in early 2014, we implemented a national outreach campaign using traditional, digital, and social media, including a tower safety web page. We framed the campaign with a powerful slogan, no more falling workers. OSHA has been working closely with the National Association of Tower Erectors, Nate, to promote safety within the tower industry. Nate promoted our fall prevention stand down and we're working with their leadership to help them understand how to contribute to future rulemaking. And Nate has announced a 100% tie off policy and campaign and we're grateful for that. This is in addition to a letter I sent concerning communication tower hazards to 100 communication tower companies and 26 state wireless associations for distribution to their membership. And Nate distributed this letter to their membership and posted it on their website. We also supported the development of a tower climber certification course organized by Nate and Above Ground Magazine. This first certification course was completed this summer as nine participants from numerous groups became authorized climbers, including an OSHA engineer and one of our attorneys. This valuable training helped Nate executives, OSHA, and other industry personnel gain practical experience in tower climbing. And we've been helping the Employment and Training Administration, ETA, that's part of the Labor Department, to develop a registered apprenticeship program for tower climbers, which will be signed later on today. Now, we recognize that this industry has a complex and somewhat unique structure with multiple levels of contracting and subcontracting from the giant telecoms and firms that broadcast signals to the companies, often very small companies, whose workers build, maintain, and repair the towers. We believe that many of these fatal incidents are related to the subcontracting of jobs to smaller employers who may overlook safety requirements because they're under pressure to complete jobs quickly and inexpensively. Today, OSHA and the FCC are calling on everyone in the industry, from major cell carriers to the owners of the towers, from tower maintenance companies down to the firms who employ the towers, the climbers, to take responsibility for worker safety. And we're very pleased to be working together with the FCC to reduce these needless fatalities and injuries. As I've said, a lot has been done to improve worker safety in this industry, but we need to do much more. There is no reason that a cellular industry that excels in enabling us to receive clear messages on our phone from people all around the world cannot also ensure that a clear safety message is communicated from the original order for a new antenna or repair down to the worker who climbing a tower with tools on his belt. This is not an impossible task. It shouldn't even be a difficult task. It's a task that we must achieve working together. I'm so grateful that Chairman Wheeler and Secretary Perez are committed to taking this next step so that we can make sure these tragedies aren't written off as the cost of doing business. We appreciate the FCC joining our initiative to reduce these needless fatalities and injuries. And I look forward to our continued collaboration with all of you and all of our stakeholders. Each of us has an important role to play in worker safety. Together we can turn this tide to prevent more unnecessary and unfortunate deaths. So thank you again for being here and for your interest in protecting tower workers. After our next speaker, we'll have two panel discussions. The first panel will address the challenges that, that are facing this rapidly growing industry. The second panel will identify some of the best practices that are being used in industry today. Following the workshops, we'll sign the agreement on an, existing, on an exciting new apprenticeship program for communication tower workers. But now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Kathy Pierce. Kathy is the mother of, of Chad Weller, a young tower climber who was killed earlier this year in Maryland. We are honored to be working with Kathy, who's been a great partner in our efforts to prevent more tower worker fatalities by sharing her compelling and unfortunate story. She is here as a testament of the unspeakable heartbreak of losing a child, an endless pain that no one deserves to endure. I'm humbled 
by her, by your courage, Kathy, and your resolve to turn tragedy into hope. So thank you all again for your interest and your commitment, and please join me in welcoming Kathy Pierce. I want to let you know what I now live with. Started out with my baby boy, with my son, grown into a young man, and now this is what I have to deal with. This is the way I have to go visit him. My name is Kathy Pierce, and I'm the mother of Chad Weller. Chad was a tower technician that took his job very seriously and was safety conscious. He loved his job. Chad was loved by many. He had a heart of gold and put a smile on everyone's face that he came in contact with. He had plans to join the Navy. this past summer to serve his country, but tragically, on March 19, 2014, the job my son loved took his life before he could feel, fulfill his dream to be in the military. Chad didn't have the chance to get married and have children. When Chad died, he left behind two very heartbroken sisters and the person that brought life to him, me, his mother. He also left behind many other family members and friends who lies, whose lives have been forever changed by his preventable death. I not only lost my son, I lost my baby boy, my best friend, and my hero. Losing Chad has changed my life forever. And I will never be the person I used to be. Chad should have never lost his life that day. His accident could have been prevented simply by not being sent up on a tower alone, not being forced to work in water, on a water tower in hazardous weather conditions. The tower had ice on it, and it was also raining. And Chad's equipment had fallen out of the truck earlier that day and was lost when they went to the gas station to get something to drink. But the foreman on site placed Chad in an extra large harness when my son wore a medium harness and forced him to climb that tower alone. We need to make some serious changes in this industry to stop the senseless loss of life. This workshop shouldn't just be a place to talk, ask, and answer questions. This workshop needs to be a place to start real change in the telecommunications industry. This needs to be a place where we honor the lives that are lost and brother, father, or friend doesn't lose someone else. I'm here today to be the voice of my son, all the fallen climbers, and all the tower technicians still out there risking their lives climbing towers to keep everyone in touch worldwide. As a grieving mother, I plead that we all unite together to make a difference in this industry.
Thank you very much, Kathy. If we could have our speakers come up for the first panel, please. As a reminder, those of you sitting here, if you would like to ask questions today, you can um, ask for note cards, raise your hand, somebody will bring you note cards. If you're watching remotely, you can either send an email to livequestions at FCC.gov or on Twitter, uh, hashtag FCC Live. Uh, please don't uh, wait until the very end to ask your questions, because given time constraints and the volume of questions, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So the first panel today will focus on diagnosing the problem. We will have two moderators for this panel. The first moderator is Chad Breckenridge. Chad is an Associate Bureau Chief in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau here at the FCC. The second moderator is Jessica Duma. Jessica is a regulatory analyst in OSHA at the Department of Labor. Quick introduction, identifying themselves and their connection to the issues we're discussing today. Um, after that, a couple minutes per, per panelist, we will get into some questions and answers, and um, ideally some questions from folks in the audience as well. So we'll see alphabetically just to make it easy, and we'll start with Dave Anthony down on the on the end. Dave owns Shenandoah Tower, based in Staunton, Virginia. He's a, a former climber himself, and has uh, demonstrated a strong commitment to safety practices in the industry. your participation in this event today. Uh, I am delighted that DOL and FCC has put this together. Uh, this is a historic development and I'm hoping it's a groundbreaking development. And that's going to depend on our determination to make change. That's going to depend on our ability and our willingness to change ourselves. So when we look at this problem, we can't look at it from the perspective of it's somebody else's problem to solve. It's all of our problem to solve. We have got to do it collectively. Safety is the common mantra of all the components of this industry, but it's not the common practice. There's a systemic problem in the industry that fosters unsafe performance. The pursuit of profits outpaces the pursuit of safety. At every level, the base decision is made by how little we can pay to get the job done. None of the deaths we have seen in the industry needed to happen. They cannot be viewed as inevitable or even as collateral, collateral cost of doing business. Rather, they should be viewed as a failure of all of us to provide for a safe work environment and safe execution of the work itself. Everything we do can and must be done safely. Providing a safe work environment takes total commitment on the part of every executive in every component in a, in entity of this industry. I want to repeat that. Providing a safe work environment takes total commitment on, e on the part of every executive in every component entity of this industry. I am fully responsible for the safety of my employees and I take that responsibility with all seriousness. But I'm limited in what I can do for anyone else and that's where we all come in together. Why are these guys dying? on a two regular basis. I tell my guys the most dangerous thing we do is drive to our job. That if they do everything they're trained to do and everything they're taught to do, they cannot get hurt on my job site. And I firmly believe that. And we have evidenced that over 31 years of business. So it is very doable for us to achieve, but you have to have the commitment at the highest level right on down to the lowest, newest guy on your team. Tower work is not for everyone. It is for a select few who can commit themselves to doing it properly and doing it safely, who will follow the instructions, who will obey 
who are determined to excel and who can brave the elements and the responsibilities of the work itself. Why are these guys dying? There's three primary reasons in my point of view. Insufficient training of workers. Introduction of training material is not training. Acquiring levels of proficiency is required. Insufficient enforcement of rules and standards. When accidents happen, they're preceded by a failure of the competent person on site. Every one of our job sites is supposed to have a competent person. That competent person is supposed to recognize every hazard that our workers can be faced with and resolve those hazards or stop the work. So this is where we are today. We need to collaborate together to resolve this problem. The other problem we have is an insufficient amount of enforcement or supervision. So I can't do it all myself. I need OSHA. I need the, the party I'm working for to be involved in the safety of my personnel. We have to ensure this because not everybody is playing with a full deck of cards. And we know the reality of what we're facing out there. So thank you for your attentiveness and we want your participation today and we want you to leave here determined to help us make a change. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, next, we would love to hear from Liz Day, who is a professor of journalism at the City of New York's Journalism School and who has researched and written extensively about the state of tower workers and their unfortunate high fatality rate. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, I'm really thrilled that we're having this conversation today, and I'm honored to be a part of it and to share a little bit of what I learned. Um, up until a few months ago, I was the director of research at ProPublica, which is an investigative reporting nonprofit in New York. In 2012, we uh, published a uh, documentary uh, with PBS Frontline and a uh, long written series on cell tower deaths. In order to do that, we um, spent over a year basically researching the industry and researching all the accidents we could find. So that entailed um, about 100 telecom tower deaths um, since 2001 to 2012 and pulling the OSHA investigation reports, pulling autopsy records, searching for lawsuits. Um, interviewing victims' families, talking to tower company owners, coworkers, eyewitnesses on the site that day to um, try to identify themes on why accidents happened. We also wanted to look more broadly at the industry, so we interviewed hundreds of tower climbers, the most important people, the people that know this industry the best. Um, we also talked to tower company owners, construction managers, turf vendor executives, carrier executives, uh, safety experts, lawyers, current and former OSHA officials, um, and p stakeholders at every layer of the industry. Um, also, uh, so we published our investigation in 2012, and then also earlier this year, we did a follow-up looking at the spike in recent accidents um, in uh, 2013 and 2014, and also discussing why um, and how OSHA has sort of changed its approach to policing the industry. I'm uh, very excited to be here, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Liz. I'd next like to introduce Bridget Hester. Bridget is a, a powerful advocate for climber safety. She's the, the president of the Hubble Foundation, which is named after her husband, whom she lost in a tower climbing accident in 2010. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, as he said, I run the Hubble Foundation. I started it shortly after my husband's death in 2010. Um, we're a nonprofit, and we care to the families of those that have passed away. We're able to advocate for them, help them navigate through OSHA reports. Um, we provide scholarships for the children and for the widows. And I also conduct um, a self-funded academic research on the industry. Um, I've been looking forward to being here. And I 
try not only to assist the families, but I'm very concerned about the safety issues within the industry as well. And I'm concerned that one thing I want from today going forward is that we don't just focus on the short term. We don't just focus on what's happened the last 12 months or 18 months, but collectively over the course of what's happened in the telecommunications industry since it started and the trends that have happened and how we might be able to change the course of those trends. Um, and I hope that the workshop serves to look, like I said, past the short term and into the horizons of what's coming in the future with telecommunications because it's only going to continue to grow. There's going to be more work, which means there's going to be more climbers and their safety is paramount. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, last but not least, I would like to introduce Wallace Reardon, who is a um, project coordinator at the Workers at Heights Health and Safety Initiative. Um, he is also a former climber with a wealth of experience, and we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to the FCC Chair, Tom Wheeler, and uh, Secretary of Labor, uh, Thomas Perez, uh, for uh, allowing this event to occur. Uh, this is big, and I feel really humbled and honored to be here. Um, the Workers at Heights Safety and Health Initiative is was the first of its kind. It was an organization that was started to be focused entirely on the climber and the perspective of the climber. And... Um, and uh, Mr. Anthony um, shared a lot of sentiments that I couldn't agree with more. And we have a lot of things, in, a lot more in common than we have in, that are different. But the climbers need, the climbers' uh, role in this industry and the employer's role have different interests and, um, and they need to be addressed. Um, what I really wanted to see, I talked to organizers of this event and um, one thing that they were really concerned about and wanted badly was to have climbers to attend this and wanted to know if I could get climbers to come and show up to this. And um, I felt pretty powerless because the climbers that I spoke to are out working on our wireless infrastructure right now. And on, well, while we're having Thanksgiving dinner, there's, there's many of those still out there working on our wireless infrastructure. Christmas, Memorial Day, you name it, they're out there working it. Good weather, bad weather. And uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge Kathy's bravery for coming up here and speaking. That's incredibly tough, and uh, it's tough to hear. Um, I, and what families go through is just astounding. Uh, and, and every one of these deaths are preventable. Uh, if I could put up a slide here, I want to talk about some of my concerns. Um, I, I've got this information from the OSHA database. Uh, I drove my family crazy for about three months because I locked myself in a room with a computer and I didn't come out and, and um, if somebody knocked on the door I'd bark at him like, a, like an angry, angry recluse. But um, I broke down the fatalities um, into 10-year increments and you can see in, uh, between 1984 and 1993 there were 69 fatalities. In 1994 OSHA promulgated 100% tie-off. Um, the, the fatalities doubled. Why did they double? Uh, the National Association of Tower Erectors was founded about that time um, in response to this problem. I, I feel that they, there are reasons for uh, coming together, and you can take that slide down, um, were, were completely honorable. And, um, and I really feel like they were concerned about saving climbers' lives. The, the fall protection um, that was available at that time when, when this was um, implemented simply wasn't available and wasn't designed uh, to, to meet our needs. And so there were a whole lot of problems that climbers were having falling into, into compliance. And I was one of those crazy radicals that um, was bound to determine I, I was going to keep my tree belt and nobody was going to make me wear a full body harness. But um, I, too... Um, went along that way. 1996, my best friend Jeff Hartman fell um, over around 100 feet and survived. He died a few, a few years later from a brain tumor. Uh, but uh, his memory is what drives me today. But I want to talk about safety in the industry. Safety is a word that's said constantly. Um, I've interviewed dozens and dozens of companies 
and um, and they love to show you their their fall their their safety policy. They'll have a big thick booklet, and they'll show you this booklet, and they to give it to every employee, and um, every employee is responsible responsible for understanding that. And um, unfortunately, in reality, most employees just see that notebook and get overwhelmed by it and throw it in the back seat and forget about it, and it's usually dumped out in the trash when the truck comes back to the shop. Um, and that's unfortunate, but um, but the company bears some responsibility in this as well. They don't follow through with their employees. Um, they're not. A lot of companies are are not do not do proper vetting of employees. Um, but my my like I said, my focus is on the climbers, and I don't like to spend a whole lot of time blaming it on employees. There's a lot of organizations that already do that. Uh, they have no problem with pointing out the, pointing out the shortcomings of climbers, but that's why the Workers' Heights started as a response to that because there are a lot of professionals that do care about safety in this industry and they do care about the truth being told, but it's not allowed to be told. And what's really missing from this this uh, group in here today, it's not filled up with climbers um, and having their input. And there's not an actual physical climber today um, sitting here that from the uh, from the workers' point of view. And that's completely sad and unfortunate. And um, lastly, I want to talk about the turfers and the carriers bear a lot of responsibility in this as well. Uh, they could do more to, to ensure that companies are following proper safety regulations. Um, AT&T, uh, I read an article that AT&T made over $2 billion in profits last year. Um, they could simply, there's no reason why they couldn't afford to hire a babysitter. If the industry is so bad, these climbers are so bad that they need a babysitter to make sure they comply with 100% tie-off, um, well, so be it. Um, employ some workers and have them out there and scare them into compliance if you have to. We'll do whatever it takes. Um, but there's an awful lot of hostility toward my type of work. Uh, people don't understand that the worker's point of view is a part that needs to be shared. Um, and unfortunately, the business interest in this industry don't allow for that. Um, and um, that's been a, a big shortcoming of the National Association of Tower Erectors wireless industry and, and the industry as a whole for not bringing climbers organized together to talk about these issues that they see every day openly and honestly without fear of retribution and being fired, uh, without being punished. Um, but this is what goes on to climbers that make a safety call today. And um, if, if, Chad's, if Chad made that point, and he probably did, but he was left with no alternative, my, my statement has always been the climber does not have control over his or her safety in the job site. They do not have that control. If they do try to exercise that control, they go to the employer, and nine times out of ten the employer will say, well, we'll find somebody else to do it. Um, apparently you don't want to work for us. And our, uh, Bridget and I have both been flooded with calls this year from climbers that have been f wrongfully fired. Um, just Trump, just for raising issues. Guys actually had the gall to ask for a paycheck. Wondered why they weren't paid in two or four weeks. They actually had the nerve to ask the employer, where's my pay? Am I going to get paid? And when they did that, they, get, they got pigeonholed, and the company, the, company, um, the company owner would pigeonhole them and talk to the other two guys that were working there who also weren't getting paid. We'll pay you guys, but... Um, Unfortunately, uh, we're going to let this other guy go, and he's going to be the bad guy for making the stand. So this is what climbers face, and um, and this has got to change. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. So what the one of the key themes of this panel is to try to diagnose the problem, to figure out why it is that there are so many fatalities and injuries in this industry. And so I'm going to cut right to the chase of the question that I think all of you can comment on. But Bridget, I'll ask you to respond first, if you would, and that is why why is it that the, the injury and fatality rate is so much higher in this industry than in other comparable industries, in, in industries where folks are working with structural steel or with other what would seem to be high-risk uh, industries. I had this conversation with Liz a little bit before we before we started. Um, I, when, when we use the term that it's X number of times more dangerous than other industries, um, I know that that all came up, was it 2007 or 2000, 2000. 2008 when they did that study? I don't, to make that comparison now, I, mean, I know that the fatality rate is higher in this industry versus some other industries. How much proportionally now? I don't know because there's more employees in the field. I think, I'm, I think a lot of it has to do 
with the training. There are way too many climbers that are getting trained and thrown into the field and asked to complete jobs that are beyond their scope of capability because they haven't They've, they've gone through comm training or they've gone through a safety rescue course so they know how to tie off. They know how to not fall. But OJT is huge in this industry and so there's a long period of time from the time you get certified to the time you're actually a tower hand. And there's a massive amount of information. Well, when you have that much work coming forward and it's each carrier is racing to get to get the best first it was 3g then 4g then lte so everybody is out there trying to beat everybody else and they're training and they're throwing people in the field and they're not at the competency level sometimes that they should be and they're not supervised as well as they should be that's not to say they're not good at their jobs they're very good at their jobs but you can't put people in a position to do something before they're ready to do it. You have got to adequately train them. And if you don't, this is what results. If others have thoughts on that, that same point, are there reasons this industry is different, its track record is different? Well, um, so as I mentioned, we analyzed about 100 total telecom deaths, 50 of which were um, on cell towers. And what we saw again and again were deadlines. And that seemed to differ from qualitative research in other industries. Um, we would see deadline pressure in an OSHA report, bluntly as an OSHA inspector writing, you know, time, money, go faster in their notes. Um, we saw it from talking to coworkers and company owners who said, you know, we had to work from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 10 days straight. You know, we had to work overnight with headlamps. We were working in dangerous conditions because we had to meet deadlines that were set from company owners, which were set by turf vendors, which were set by the carriers at the top. Um, in addition to deadlines, we also saw um, poor equipment. And, you know, Kathy's um, story about the extra large harness gave me chills because we saw that in too many deaths. We saw a 10 year old harness that was caked in rust found, you know, on a worker who had fallen. There's no reason anyone should be using an expired, outdated harness that isn't working. We saw people using hooks that were missing safety latches. We saw all sorts of equipment that never should have been used. Um, in addition to that, the third element that we saw often with accidents was um, poor training. And that could be anything from workers saying, you know, I was never trained and I was put up on the tower, to people saying, yes, I was trained, but I watched a video and I, you know, circled some multiple choice answers correctly and, you know, that was the extent of my training. I don't want to belabor the point, but um, basically we're an undisciplined, unruly industry. There's a lot of people not doing the right thing. It takes the right people doing the right things to achieve the best results, to keep the guys safe, to get the job done right. So there's a lot of room for change and improvement, and it's got to be brought to bear at my end and at the very top end. So we all got to work together to resolve this problem. The problem is going to get worse because the densification of, of uh, the spectrum, the densification in the marketplace is directly correlates to densification on the tower. The tower is a much more hazardous environment now than it was 10 years ago. There's lots of things to move around and move by. And that complicates access to the job site and from the job site. It adds to fatigue. We understand one thing. When a tower climber is doing his job, he is under stress the entire time. From the time he leaves the ground to the time his feet hit it again, and in many cases, he's up there all day long and sometimes way longer than he ought to be. So we have got to be, contractors have got to become disciplined. These are people. They are not machines. And our customers have got to understand that there are limitations to what they can drive the contractors to in every situation. Again, we've got to solve this together. Uh, from my, my numbers I shared on that slide, it doesn't need to be brought back up, but um, 
there's an incredibly large number of uh, free climbing that's going on in this industry, and that is the taboo subject for everybody. Uh, companies don't want to talk about it. Climbers don't want to talk about it because they're probably like me. They enjoy doing it. Um, they like the thrill of the job. That's what attracts people to this industry. And um, but this is what's it's, this is what's causing the fatalities. And from my numbers that I came up with, uh, I came up with 77 percent of the fatalities in this industry were related to free climbing. And but when I call free climbing, what I mean by is climbing not connected to the structure. And also, I included those who are riding the winch line, riding loads up a tower, riding a cab stand and a rope, uh, riding a rope being pulled up a tower by a truck. Um, I also consider them uh, free climbing in the fact that they were not protected from a fall um, per OSHA requirements of six feet or less. Uh, so that's why I have such an astounding number um, like that. But. Um, but it, it clearly is a problem in this industry that um, it's, a, it's the most popular way for, for contractors to pick up the pace of work. Uh, it's the quickest way to get the jobs done. It's the quickest way they think of. Uh, Winton Wilcox, years ago, when I, when I talked to him in 2008 about this, uh, he, he, he had a hard time imagining that free climbing even existed anymore. And he kind of blamed it on, he, he blamed it on uh, older guys like me and uh, that had this cowboy attitude. And, and um, but but what I what I was seeing in the field was something completely opposite. In fact, um, from my time of climbing from 1992, um, I went out with an injury and illness in 2002, um, and and monitored the industry right up until today. Um, and I've seen dozens of crews out in the field, companies, um, and of all of them, I've only seen two companies that were following 100% tie-off two companies out of all of that. And one was Andrew, and um, another one was MUTI this year. But I had some discrepancies about how they were hooking off at the top, uh, which wasn't appropriate. But, um, but they acknowledged that. And um, uh, at least they have, uh, were open to um, my, my criticism. But lastly, the, um, there's no standardization of training in this industry. It's, it's sorely lacking, and it's something that's needed. And um, for years, I mean, the industry's, Nate's been talking about this. You know, the industry's got to correct itself. You hear a lot of company owners talk about this and climbers. We got to correct this ourselves. Well, I, 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 I couldn't disagree more. I think we in, need the involvement of Teddy Roosevelt's big stick of government um, to scare com companies into compliance. I know that drives people crazy, but, but OSHA needs to be properly funded um, so they can get compliance officers out in the field to monitor this. Um, uh, my my uh, greatest wealth uh, of my activism was, um, I was I knew that companies were scared to death of OSHA coming on their job site. And if I could put that fear in somebody, if you have an accident and I find out about it, I'm going to call up OSHA and the chances are extremely high they're going to investigate. And um, But since ProPublica's story came out and acknowledged the shortcomings of, uh, of OSHA, um, it's kind of been emboldened employers to, to go back out and not worry about that. And, um, and that's something that's got to be changed. But, um, but I agree with everything else that's already been pointed out here. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I guess it, it has seemed, especially in the past year, like there has been um, sort of an increase in the number of fatalities caused by tower collapses not just workers falling off of towers, but workers climbing on towers that weren't safe. Um, do you all feel that this is an unusual thing for this year, or is it indicative of something that we should be looking at more closely on the horizon? Uh, Dave pointed out a, a harbinger of things to come, for sure. Uh, he, he's, he's, he, he, he explained the um, lack of designing this or engineering this going into these builds, if any, sometimes. Um, a lot of towers are overstressed. Uh, Craig Lacutus has had some articles out about overloading of towers and, and that fundamentally going on. And, and in fact, that's been some issues that I've been, been trying to raise to OSHA, and they can't go out on a job site and do an, inspe do an investigation on the tower. Um, they got to investigate on the workers to make sure the workers are protected. So there's something really lacking there that, that needs to be um, pointed out, and a lot of climbers are, are making that known, that they're having these problems in the field. And um, there was a tower section out in North Carolina a couple of years ago where the top section of the tower 
There was nothing bolted or nothing welded on it. It was completely put together with U-bolts around round tower legs. And um, so the tower would get on it and twist and turn when they were on there working. Um, that sounded incredibly dangerous, and I hope it's been changed now. But um, but it, it, I think it's, it's, it's something that has been a thing that's been waiting to happen. Uh, I don't, uh, what I notice in, in trends in the industry, they kind of go in, in groups. And, uh, but what I've come up with um, on my research uh, from my OSHA investigation, 17% um, of the fatalities were directed, directly related to collapse and, um, and uh, structural failure on towers that caused somebody to fall. Thanks. Any, anybody else have thoughts on that? Well, we're just beginning to see deaths from tower collapses due to improperly done mods. Those are going to increase if we don't change the way we approach them. And uh, same thing with the free climbing. Uh, he is absolutely right. The majority of the guys out there are free climbing. It's a sport. And they don't know what they don't know. And so their employer will take on jobs that they're not prepared to do not equipped to do, and then they'll go out there and have to try to figure it out in the field, and they are not prepared. These guys who are dying are dying because they just didn't know any better. So of all the contractors that you might have under your employee, maybe 25% at best are capable of doing a mod change or a mod upgrade and doing it properly and doing it safely. But yet they're all bidding. You might have 12 people bidding a job. Low bid is not the way to go on something as important as modifications of towers. There's got to be a pro qualification process. There's got to be collaboration between the tower owner, the design engineer, and the contractor. There's got to be vetting uh, of the process, of the methodology. It's not something the contractor should solve on his own. We have, if we collaborate, we can solve the problem. The whole deal with safety is to identify the risk and then to mitigate those risks. A tower hand is a bolt turner. Now, I know what I know after 30 plus years, 40 years in the industry, 30 years having my own company. I know what I know, but I don't know everything. I'm learning every day. And my guy who's been with me for three years, he may be in a lead position at that point in time, but he only knows what he knows. And it's the thing that the guys do not know that is killing them. It's obvious they're not doing this on purpose. We have got to help them. They're innocent, and they need our protection. And we have the power to do it, but we've got to quit protecting our bottom line and start protecting the worker. Indeed, I've got it. Thank you. Uh, following up to that, you mentioned that there's a there's some some folks out there are going for low bids to try to get in cutting corners where they can. And I'm curious to know, um, from your perspective, with a company that's got a strong safety track record, how you can compete when your competitors are going in with low bids and whether, whether your safety conscious approach affects your, your bottom line in a, in a way that um, is deterring others. Well, yes, it does affect my bottom line. It affects my, vo my volume. I mean, I, 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 I lose a lot of bids. But I'm going to do it right or I'm not going to be in the business. And that's a, that's a judgment that I made a long time ago when I started, I started as a niche player just repairing the messes that other people made, and one thing led to another, and I had enough experience when cellular started to come into play that I got to build the first cellular towers in my locality, and that was a real thrill, and we enjoyed every minute of it. In those days, the majority of those towers were guide towers. So the, all those sites and all those builds were a lot of fun, and we learned from everyone, and we worked as a tight unit. And uh, I was out there with my guys, so I knew what was going on. I knew who was doing what. And if I had a non-performer, I could see that, and I could train them. As we grow older and we add layers of, uh, of supervision and everything, you have to be reinforcing that with those people and passing it on down the line. But, yes, yeah, safety costs money, but I sleep well at night. And I know that every one of my guys, every day, every moment he's on the tower is 100% tied off. It is a very achievable thing. And I totally agree. We, we roll up on sites all the time and find other crews on the tower free climbing. And for customers here, who is safe for safety is first. But in reality, it was a low bid guy, and they drove three states away to do the same job that I was right there an hour away to do, but didn't get the job. 
So this is a process and an and a issue that we all have got to embrace and we've got to change from the top down. All right? Or we're not going to make any headway because we will still be faced with the same issues down the road if the judgment is profits are more important than the safety of the worker. Let's find those solutions together. Thank you. Um, I think because all of you have had conversations with a lot of climbers and, and are very familiar with the nature of the work, um, one of the things that's come up is that w climbers are often away from their homes for extended periods of time and working very long hours. Um, can each of you speak a little bit to the effect that that can have on the safety culture, if there is one, and um, if you have any thoughts, what could be done to make that less of an issue? I'd be glad to embrace that. Again, tower climbers are people. And if you want the best people working for you so you can achieve the best results, you've got to treat them with dignity and respect. That means they need to be home with their loved ones. Um, why do we get in our trucks and drive thousands of miles past all that work that's out there and not work in our own backyard and, be, and make it a profitable experience and allow our guys the privilege of being home with their families on the weekends. If they're gone you, week after week after week, you use control over the personalities, over the character of those men and women. And I believe that's one of the problems, pre prevalent problems in our industry. We have to build character here. <coughs> the reason I do what I do, I love tower work. But I don't get to do tire work anymore. Now I manage an enterprise. You know what I like about that? Is I get to hire boys and I get to cultivate men. I get to build character into them. I get to, I get to build into them skills and craftsmanship. And no matter how long they work for me when they leave, for whatever reason, they are better equipped to face the day than they were when they came to me. I want them to be home. I want them to be with their families. I want them to be uh, informed, molded by their families. And you can't do that if you're on the road uh, hours and weeks and months at a time. And there's plenty of research that goes to the fact that the longer when in high travel jobs, I looked at some stuff on even over the road truck drivers and all of that as well. And the average I think for the climber average amount of travel is close to if not just over 300 days a year and when you stretch somebody that thin the relationships at home break down it affects marital relationships it affects parent child relationships I've talked to newer I've talked to several climbers that even called me in tears because they had been gone three four five six months before they were back in their own market to go home and see their families and marriages have ended People have missed, men have missed their babies taking their first step. It's extremely stressful. And, you know, like you said, you've got to be able to treat them with respect. And if I'm a huge advocate of if you will just, as an employer, if you will let people know that they are appreciated and that they matter, your productivity from that worker is going to go up. And you can't just give lip service to it. You have to show that with action. Rotate them out, let them go home, work locally in your own backyard so that they can be rotated out and go home. Or if you got, if you have to work across the country or, or another market over, send a crew out and rotate them out with another crew in a couple, two, three weeks so that everybody has time to be home to regroup, refocus, spend some, spend some time with their family, even if they're not married and don't have kids. They have friends, they have parents, they have, you know, peers and they need that time. It's good for their mental health because I promise you if you have a guy on a tower that's been working and he's been gone for four months, he's doing his job, but there is a part of his brain that is not concentrating on what he's doing. He's worried about how much money is my check going to be? Did I send it home? I wonder if she went on her first date. 
are we still having that fight? Am I going to have another fight when I get off here and I have to call the wife back? These all build up, and it does affect the way workers perform their job immensely. Thank you. Uh, again, that order what everybody else has added so far, um, but also there are some workers' rights issues involved in this too. Um, a lot of cli when I was climbing, um, we were paid travel time to and from the job site every time. If we if the employer didn't do that, he wouldn't be able to keep a workforce. Um, there's an incredible demand on the industry right now, so that's not quite such a premium anymore. And um, a lot of climbers are not getting paid until they get out to the job site and start working. This can put it, this increases the danger considerably on the job site. Uh, if you've got guys that are driving cross country all day and all night for possibly a couple of days, they fully understand the fact that when they roll onto the job site, their work week is just beginning. And, uh, and so the work goes. And so like, like, like Liz pointed out, you got guys working with headlamps, they got the shop lights out and stuff like that working at night um, to compensate for that and also to compensate uh, for the work time that is lost in all this travel and stuff. And uh, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with the stresses that it puts on the family. Um, uh, even even we, uh, the employers I had put an extra effort into keeping us close to home they didn't see any, uh, they, they had enough work to stay close to home. So it, when we went out on the road, it, it didn't seem like a whole lot. But we were home every weekend for the most part. Um, uh, but my, fam my family fully understood that I was only home for pretty much a couple of weeks out of the year, even at that rate. Uh, but we've got a lot of climbers that are gone for weeks. And a couple, on, in a few experiences, experiences, they've been on the road for over a month or more. And... And, um, and what that does to families, it does, what goes on at home happens in the field. It, you take it on the job site with you. And, and um, I had an experience with a climber that he was a suicide threat. And, and uh, it was a, one of the most terrifying experiences I ever had. But, uh, you know, I sat in a, in a crowded restaurant and have a, have a co-worker just start screaming at his wife because they want, they're in an argument. And, you know, these kind of things go on a lot. And... Um, and it, and it just puts an immense pressure on climbers, and, and, and that's what leads to the, the problems with the alcohol and the drugs. Um, you know, it just sort of perpetuates this problem, makes treatment if, for any of these um, extremely difficult. Um, thanks. Hey Liz, I've got a question for you that came in from the audience, and others may want to chime in on it as well. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the fatalities that are occurring, but not as much about near misses. And I wonder if in your conversations with, with tower workers when you were reporting on this, whether you had any insight into whether they report near misses, whether they're encouraged not to, whether that information is tracked anywhere, or whether we should be learning from that in addition to the actual fatalities and injuries that are happening. Well, near misses and serious injuries are a huge issue, and I wish I had more to say about it, um, but I think a big part of the problem is that there isn't much data on that. Um, I believe they're not required to report it to OSHA unless three or more people are hospitalized, um, which, you know, sometimes you have one guy just out on a tower by himself. Sometimes it's two. Very rarely do you have enough people that three will be hospitalized and it'll be required to be reported to OSHA. And that's the first step to, you know, understanding any injuries is having data on it and understanding how often they happen, why they happen, and um, so forth. Um, from talking to workers, you know, you do hear that injuries and near misses happen a lot more than anyone would like. And... Um, <clears throat> you know, are similar to fatalities. It's, you know, someone um, making a bad decision or having a slip or dropping a piece of equipment and it just missing someone on the ground. Um, so, I, you know, I wish I had more to say um, about, you know, causes or way to prevent um, serious injuries, but the best we can assume is that they're, you know, similar enough to what we know from studying fatalities. Having nothing to say is also saying a lot. Uh, a lot of the, uh, when there's an injury, uh, the name of the employee is protected under the, under the idea that it protects the worker's rights, or right, um, right to, to, um, is to, to be named in that incident. Um, 
but it provides excellent cover for employers as well. And this is what makes this data very difficult to find. To Nate's merit, in the past, they've tried to, they've worked on initiatives to try and gather this kind of information from its own members. I don't know how that ever turned out. Uh, and as far as I understand, I also believe in January of next year, OSHA will, will begin requiring um, uh, employers to report injuries, um, uh, any injuries that require hospitalization. Um, but we aren't even talking about the ones that aren't going to the hospital. A lot of, a lot of climbers are walking wounded. Um, they're injured and they refuse treatment and they stay out in the field and keep working. And um, that's a story waiting to be told. And I think that's uh, the fatalities really are the tip of the iceberg in this industry, um, trying to get to the bottom of the real dangers in, in it. Okay. Um, I think one of the other areas um, where you all might be able to shed some light is um, the involvement of the various other players, the turf vendors and the carriers and the tower owners um, in the safety culture and, and what influence they currently have or could have on safety. Um, I think, Liz, you've spoken to a lot of those people. If you'd like to start off, that would be great. Sure. Um, so when we looked at the industry, we wanted to talk to stakeholders at every level. And, um, you know, we talked to a lot of climbers, talked to a lot of company owners. Uh, we talked to uh, turf vendor executives and general contractors and people in the middle management firm layer. And then we also talked to the carriers and the tower owners at the top who ultimately are the ones who are bidding out this work. And, um, you know, you can discuss and debate the definition of control, but they are, in essence, controlling the work. Um, and what we saw by talking um, to people at all of these layers and also analyzing contracts, and there was only one um, time that we saw someone tried to sue a, a carrier for a death, a, con a, a worker's family, um, and analyzing the legal filings there and the arguments that were made. Um, what we saw and, you know, what safety experts who reviewed um, our documents told us as well was that, you know, the culture from the carriers and um, the people at the top is sort of a CYA contracts. You know, we make the, we have our general contractors and our turf vendors sign a contract that says we agree to, you know, do work safely. We will, um, you know, drug test. We will do background checks and we will ensure everyone's trained. And wherever in the system that breaks down differs in every accident. But um, what we did see over and over again was that that you know signing of the contract did not ensure that um, people were well trained or that people were drug tested or that people were wearing proper equipment and working safely. Um, so you know whose ultimate responsibility is that? Uh, people have a lot of different opinions. What we were told by safety experts um, was that, you know, the people at the top have the most control to change everything. They are the ones, you know, if you want to just try to weed out bad contractors at the bottom, it's a game of whack-a-mole. You're never going to really have systemic change. But the people at the top who are ultimately paying the bill um, and have control over who is doing the work, um, could stop this a lot more and sort of have a, a change in the whole system um, by, you know, not hiring these people and putting an end to it. Um, we saw, you know, in accidents where the company was fined for having safety violations, we would find they were back working shortly thereafter for other carriers, for the same carrier, the same tower owner that the accident was under. Why is that happening? Um, and, you know, what we were told was, well, we don't know, but we have our middle management firm sign a contract saying that they vet these companies at the bottom. And, you know, there's some breakdown there. 
Um, we would also hear from um, construction managers and project managers in uh, the management firms that were supposed to be overseeing the safety and be uh, the oversight for the workers at the bottom that, you know, there was no way they could check on all of these sites that they were supposed to be randomly inspecting. And also sometimes they would show up and it wouldn't be the contractor who they were expecting on site because the company that got the bid subcontracted it out. You know, sometimes a few layers. So you don't know who's on site. Um, you know, do they have, did they sign a form saying we, you know, did a safety checklist before we climbed the tower? Sometimes, sometimes they didn't. Um, so, you know, I think that there's responsibility at all different layers, but we have been told again and again by safety experts um, and people who've, you know, studied safety in a lot of industries that the most change uh, could happen at the top. I was a foreman for many years uh, when I was climbing, and uh, when I, I would get a call, I uh, would talk with a project manager from the carrier or from the turf vendor that was on site or the larger contractor we were working for. I don't remember ever having a call with any of them that didn't end up with a question, you're going to be done today, right? And they weren't going to accept any other answer than yes. That's the only answer they will accept. It doesn't matter whether you're expecting that job to be completed today or not. It could be a week, a week and a half. But every day you have a talk with those, with those construction managers. Uh, Wally, come on, you're going to get this done today, right? You know, and this puts immense pressure on the, on the foreman um, to get the climbers to uh, perform. And um, again, this is where I'm, I differ from the rest of the industry. Um, our interests are different uh, because the worker is being affected deeply here. Um, the the industry is vehemently anti-union, and um, I'm a little more uh, open-minded to a union. And, I, and going back to that information I shared earlier, in 1994, when when, when the tower industry's fatality rate doubled, the iron workers' union, their fatality rate went right down. They became a success story because of 100% tie-off. Why was that? Because rank-and-file workers were involved in the process. They were, they, were given, they were given ownership of their role. They could take pride in their role. You know, I know a lot of climbers that are absolutely proud of what they do, um, but when it, when it comes to, to doing it collectively, they kind of get, get a little edgy and uh, they don't like it. But, um, uh, but I, I strongly support the um, organization of the workers in this industry. Um, I think that's the only way that we're going to get a group together, together that can safely talk about these issues without being punished for it and without being f fear of being blacklisted. I, I, see, I see that thrown out there so many times that climbers fear being blacklisted. And they'll post it on Facebook. There will be five or six job offers in, the, in that thread within the hour sometimes. Um, it's, it's insane. Um, but the climbers don't have a voice in this, and, and, and the carriers and the, and the turfers don't want to be involved in this. They don't want to be responsible for any of this. They, they got money to make, and this might cost them money. And the bigger companies, bigger corporations might get a bigger suit, you know, a, a penalty from OSHA. Um, that's a bitter pill for them to swallow, and I don't think they're too enthusiastic about getting into the mix. Hey Bridget, I've got a, a question that I'd like you to, to take the first crack at, if you would, and following up on the moving remarks from Kathy earlier today. I, I wonder to the extent to which you've, you've learned in all of your work in this area that weather conditions and other sort of temporary things, darkness, things like that are playing a role that don't need to be played and whether there's something to be done about it. I think that it plays a bigger role than most people think. I literally just got a call yesterday from a lady whose son fell 70 feet off of a water tower and he his fall was broke by um, the ice bridge. And both of his feet are broken, spleen laceration, multiple internal hematomas, um, pelvis broken six places. And they were sent up at night because it had to be done by morning. And he was sent up, I think there were a total of two out there. And that just goes to it. But the weather conditions do make a difference. And then you had Chad's um, accident where it had been snowy a couple days before that. It was covered in ice. And then, of course, it was raining. It, 
and I have seen, and I know you've seen it too, it's social media, they, they get really active when they post on there. And there was a guy that posted a picture. He was on the tower, and there was a tornado. Like, I don't know how far. I mean, as the crow flies, probably two or three miles maybe. But I, and I've seen guys say, it's a, it's thunder, and I need to get down. I mean, this is the stand. I mean, if it's thundering, you know you have to get down because lightning is obviously within shot. But one man's typhoon is another man's, is another foreman's gentle spring rain. So there are foremen out there that will that will make their men climb. And it kind of goes to what Wally was saying is, yes, I think to a large degree the carriers and the pressurized deadlines, that plays in everything. And on the other hand, too, I think the climbers need to be able to say, no, I'm not doing this. It's not safe. I'm not going up there, and I'm sure not sending my crew up there, no, without the fear of getting fired for it. They, I mean, it's either you lose your job or you put food on the table. It's that simple. And in that moment, they may think, I can't get another job, or I can't, I, I'll, I'll get blackballed if, if, I, if I say, no, I'm not going to do this. And, and the weather conditions have, have gotten to the point where I, I've gotten calls from, from different climbers where they've been petrified to climb. And I've talked a couple out of it, but sometimes I hear more after the fact of, oh, you're not going to be happy with me, you know, because they'll call and tell me what they've done. And I'm like, well, okay, A, you don't have to answer me, but did you think that that was a good idea? Well, no, but they told me I was going to get fired. And so regardless of the weather conditions, yes, they play a huge role, especially in the winter, because of the, the severe winds and the temperature drops the higher you go. They need to be better protected from the elements, and I think that that goes to gear, but I also think that that goes to the mindset of the foreman and the person running the job of it's not safe for my men to be up there. They need to take more responsibility for it. So, um, you know, you, you touched on uh, the employees getting involved in, in posting online and, th and things like that. Um, in addition to the uh, upcoming change in, in the OSHA reporting requirement where a single hospitalization will be enough to starting in January. Um, in addition to, to that as a source of information, what other places can you suggest that people who are interested in this and interested in, in training their employees about the kinds of accidents that can happen, where can they go to get information about the sorts of hazards that people, that, about the things they don't know about yet that they can encounter? Like just coming into the industry and not knowing the hazards or not knowing what it entails. That and, and statistics and, and that sort of information. I got a lot of my statistics from Liz. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would love if OSHA published more data online. And I know that OSHA has um, have a new initiative to, to collect more data um, after an accident and identify, you know, other companies involved in the management layer and carriers. And I hope they will publish that data and put that online because right now you in OSHA's database if you query you know yeah or, or Black and Beach or Verizon um, no death will show up you have to know the the contractor and sometimes it's you know the subcontractor or whatever so it's very hard to get um, data and you know Craig at wireless estimator has done an amazing job of, of collecting um, the names or the the dates of accidents and um, publishing that out there, which I think is a great resource. I would love if that information was also more freely available through OSHA. Um, one thing that we did was we, uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, requested the OSHA investigation reports of all of the deaths. And I think that would be really great if OSHA released them as well to the public um, so that everyone could could learn and, and read after an accident happened and see the investigators' notes and see comments on, you know, the weather, or the time, or uh, equipment, all the things we've been discussing and, you know, be better informed and, and make decisions um, themselves as well. Because when it comes to collecting the data, too, I took and looked 
looked at from 1984 to present. I've gone through, and there was another researcher that was helping me with that, and he had already done a lot of FOIA requests, and so there's names from 1984 to now, and each case on there has its own inspection number so I took that inspection number and I looked up each summary and I pulled information off of it and I'm and, and I'm still working on that as well but I mean there needs to be some consistency too when it comes to the summaries I have seen summaries that give a pretty good description of what happened and then there are those that say Employee number one was 240 feet in the air. Employee number one fell. Employee number one is dead. I mean, it, that three sentences, and that was it. There was no descriptive indication of, like she said, weather. There was no, was there anything having to do with equipment? Was it they weren't tied off? Were they free climbing? Were they, did somebody rig something incorrectly? Did it collapse? I mean, there's just no information. It's not detailed enough. And for anybody that wants the information, I mean, they can, they're more than welcome to have whatever information I have. And you, they have to kind of dig on their own for right now. And I, and I agree with Liz that it, I understand the whole freedom of information and you've got to protect certain people and players in that. And I understand that. But there's general information that could be given that's not available. And I do, by the way, think it's a good, they need to start tracking when there is an injury that results in a hospitalization. There are so many, and you can attest to this, there are men and women that get injured doing this job and it's not reported to OSHA because like it doesn't require, because it's not the three. And then there's a catastrophic accident and I think people forget you know, the guy that fell off the tower last year and was in a coma and came out of the coma, or the other man, Michael Irvies, that fell and hit a guide wire and bounced and is paralyzed from the waist down. It's there, and then it's gone, and the injured guys and women get forgotten. And they're not... I don't know how to put it. I guess it just kind of fades out, and that's not right either because they are left while you and I are left with a void because somebody we loved is gone. You've got injured families that have to deal with an ongoing issue for the rest of their lives, and that needs to be readily tracked. Because, and then later may die from their injuries, complications from their injuries, which would qualify it as, as an industry-related death, but you don't ever hear about it. We unfortunately have a few more minutes to go on, on this panel, and I'd like to give you each a chance to, to close with, with a particular um, remark if you'd like to. But, Dave, I've got one question for you, and I'd be grateful if you could touch on this as, as you wrap up. And that is we've heard a lot about how time pressures are a, a big part of the problem here, and I'm curious to know how you, how you handle that in your company, whether it's pressures from your, your customers or within your organization with foremen urging crews to work quicker, what, what, what your solution is for that. Well, time... Pressures are something that I have to manage. It's my responsibility to manage those and to say back to my customer, what you're asking can't be done in that time frame. Same thing with safety issues. It's my responsibility to say what you're asking us to do is not safe and we won't do it that way. We will, here's a proposal, a counterproposal. There's a lot of contractors in this room, friends of mine, acquaintances through Nate, and we have all heard well, if you won't do it that way, or if you won't do it in that time frame, we'll find somebody else. All right? So that's why we say that even when we're doing our best, it's not going to be enough to change the systemic problem. The systemic problem starts at the very top of the industry. And if you're sitting here and have heard all this so far today and you haven't felt a nudge in your own heart, to change the way you operate, then I've got to ask you, have you been paying any attention? I want to challenge you. If you haven't felt that nudge for you personally to operate differently, what's the purpose of our getting together? This is not a feel-good event. We're facing a tsunami of deaths in this industry as we look to what's coming down the road. This is the place that we are, and it's the place that we made and we have got to change the scenario in the equation. Carriers, 
What can you do to enhance safety in the tower industry? Carefully hire companies that can demonstrate they are paying the price to hire the right people. Give them the proper tools and training and demonstrate that they hold themselves and their employees accountable. Then pay them what they're worth. Quit trying to distance yourself from liabilities. Rather, diagnose their liabilities and remedy them. If the chief executives of any major carrier, or any major company, any company at all, decided today that the day was the day they were going to change the culture in this industry and stop the next tragedy from occurring, then I believe it would have an immediate and universal impact almost overnight. Our mantra is safety. Our practice is profits. We have got to change our practice to safety. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Liz? Um, so I think that, um, you know, sharing some of the wisdom that we learned in our year-long investigation, one of the, you know, important themes that um, people brought up again and again was that there's not enough skin in the game at every level. You know, if a worker dies, that, you know, th that impact is felt more heavily at the bottom through his family, through the company owner who owned the company um, that he was working for. And, um, but when you sort of move up the layer, there's not as much liability or responsibility um, from different companies in that contracting chain. And I think, you know, from what we heard from safety experts, that th that is something that um, would have more impact if there were, you know, whether that be OSHA fines or legal liability or, you know, just transparency to the public when there's an accident, that this was not just, you know, an isolated incident from Joe's Towers. This also involved companies that you may know of and that you may um, subscribe to for your cell service. Um, another thing that, you know, we heard again and again, and I definitely experienced through my research, was more public transparency with data. And I think that, you know, I heard that a lot from victims' families was, you know, we just want people to know when they use their phone that, you know, my brother died, uh, you know, working a tower so that your cell phone can work. So I think it's really important for, you know, the, the important work that tower climbers do and the incredible risk that they put themselves um, at every day uh, to be better understood um, by the public. And I think part of that, you know, OSHA can be a real powerful force for in, um, you know, making their data more public, collecting um, more variables and um, sharing that. So, you know, it, it isn't up to kind of outside researchers doing news clip searching and interviewing people to actually get the number of how many workers have died in the last 10 years and how many of them were on cell towers versus telecom towers or how many injuries have there have been. Thank you, Liz. I did, uh, in, the, in the spirit of time pressure and industry, we're going to try to wrap up quickly here, but I want to make sure that uh, Bridget and Molly, you have a chance to make some quick remarks. I'm not going to beat a dead horse because I agree with everything they've already said, but and but I'm going to jump back to what Wally said at the very beginning is the key element that I'm not seeing in changing the safety culture, which needs to be changed, is I don't see the industry bringing in the fold the guy on the tower, the one that boots on the ground that's traveling all the time. They are smart. They are intelligent, and they have a lot to offer in changing the safety culture. But I have heard time and time and time again that they that they feel unappreciated, that their bosses think that they're pretty much monkeys running around on a tower and twisting bolts and don't have anything beyond that to offer. And I vehemently disagree with that. They are extremely intelligent. They have a lot to offer, and they're not being utilized. And I don't think it's fair to them because – all of these decisions are made about them and what's best for them. Use them. Listen to them. Talk to them. And have input from them. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Um, but uh, when, it, when it comes right down to the, the end of the day, worker empowerment is, is very important. Um, uh, family, people don't 
really comprehend what really happens to a family when a fatality occurs. Uh, there's been a talk, uh, Bridget, Bridget's had a beautiful foundation raising money for climbers and stuff like that, and the industry's gone and, and, and taken their role in this and with a family foundation and stuff like that. Um, but I'm really concerned about the comments that they make. Uh, the idea of is, is to help, help the families out with grocery money. I can tell you from a family, seeing a lot of family members go through this, they're not looking for grocery money. That's the last thing on their mind. And furthermore, um, a dead climber is a cheap climber. Um, when, there, when there's an injury, the, the bills are catastrophic, and the family's left to fall on public services, so it costs the taxpayers tons of money. Um, and the families go through this torture of having benefits cut back on them, having to prove that they're, they're disabled. Um, it's just an injustice that, that it's on a scale that I, I can't even wrap my mind around at times. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And um, now, before we go to break, it's my pleasure to introduce FCC Commissioner Pai, who will give us a few remarks. Thanks to the uh, participants on the prior panel. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes uh, to add my comments to the course because this is an issue that has been important to me for some time. Early on in uh, my tenure as a commissioner, I went to the Empire State Building in New York City and we went to the very top of the building to look at some of the broadcast infrastructure. And uh, it was scary enough for me, uh, being afraid of heights, being on that 85th floor in a very cramped room, seeing these big broadcast pipes. But then we went outside onto a platform the gentleman who was giving us the tour pointed upward and said, now just take a look at that tower. And all the way up, literally into the clouds, I saw a tall broadcast tower with a bunch of infrastructure on it. It was a pretty windy day. And I could not even fathom how it was that people summoned the courage at, and the gumption to go up there and to make some of the changes to some of this infrastructure. And it brought home to my mind something that OSHA has made uh, repeatedly clear, which is that this is the most dangerous job in America. And speaking for myself, and I'm sure for my colleagues at the FCC, I just wanted to say thanks to the people who do it, uh, who take the risk, who spend time away from their families, and all too often uh, pay a very significant price, as do their families. Uh, a lot of us here uh, at the agency and throughout the country uh, always talk about wireless service and how important it is and how more and more people are relying on it. We take for granted some of the towers we see across uh, the country that are dotting the landscape. Uh, but very few of us take the time to think about what goes into making that infrastructure work and maintaining it. And so I think it's really critical for us to have this workshop and uh, to have agencies who are on the beat making sure that we make this job, as dangerous as it is, as safe as it possibly can be. Uh, because you know the figures. Uh, the, the graph tells the tale. More deaths in 2013 than in the prior two years combined. 11 deaths this year alone. And some people who uh, don't suffer fatalities nonetheless suffer injuries. I think of uh, Tommy Jeglum, who fall, fell from a tower last year, uh, was in a coma for a couple of months, and uh, his uh, girlfriend didn't think she was going to, that he was going to make it. Uh, fortunately, he did, and they were married last year on Christmas Day. But as you know all too well from the prior panel, uh, a lot of people have paid a much more significant price. And I want to specifically thank uh, you know, Bridget from the Hubble Foundation for the work that she's doing. You know, July 22nd, 2010 is not a date I know that rests easily with her. Um, you know, her husband fell from a tower when a truck backed up into the tower that they were working on, and it brought home to her, I think, an issue that all of us uh, need to pay attention to, which is that this is not a, a safe job. And uh, the work that she does to put families a little more uh, at peace financially is such a significant thing. Uh, I read a story about a $5,000 grant that her foundation gave to a family, and the recipient just started crying because she thought she was going to have to sell off her furniture and all of her belongs just to make, make do. Uh, there are a lot of good folks like her who are doing great work across the country, and so we salute you, and we hope that your efforts are replicated everywhere. 
so thank you once again uh, for having this workshop, for attending. Uh, I just wanted to add my two cents to say that on you know, behalf of my office and again to the agency, uh, we share your mission and we want to make this uh, a success. Uh, and you know, thank you once again for, for participating. Thanks. So we're going to take a quick break now when we will reconvene at 1040. Thank you. Could we have the speakers for the next panel please come get seated? Excuse me? Could we have the speakers for the next panel please come forward if everybody could take their seats? We'd like to get started in the next minute or two. Could everybody please take their seats and the speakers come forward? So thank you, everybody. We're going to get started with the second panel now. So the second panel this afternoon is going to be focusing on implementing the solution. We, again, will have two moderators for this panel. The first moderator is Michael Jansen. Michael is a legal advisor in the front office of the Wireless Bureau here at the FCC. And the second moderator is Jim Maddox. Jim is the Director of Construction Safety for OSHA at the Department of Labor. Thank you. Is this on? Are we, are we good to go? Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, for the second panel, uh, we just want to remind viewers of the live stream that they can email questions to livequestions at FCC.gov or using our Twitter account by using the FCC Live hashtag. For this panel, we have six experts in this field. The first is Jonathan Campbell, 
who is with PCIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association. The second is John Johnson, Vice President, Director of Corporate Environmental Safety and Health and Security at Black and & Veatch. And the third is Craig Lacutis, WirelessEstimator.com, the president of WirelessEstimator.com. And I'll turn it over to Jim to introduce the other three panelists. So we also have with us today, uh, sorry about that, uh, Art Pregler with AT&T. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Paul Roberts with American Tower, and uh, Todd Schleckaway with NATE, the National Association of Tower Directors. So for this panel, we'll start in the same format as the last panel with opening remarks from each of the panelists in alphabetical order, and then we'll start with some questions from the moderators, and then open it up to questions from the audience and over the questions that are coming in over email. So Jonathan? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Jim, for uh, having me here today. It's an, it's an honor to participate on this panel. Um, I think this workshop today and all the participate, uh, participants and all the audience members are a reflection of the industry's uh, focus on improving safety and uh, cultivating a, a culture of safety in the workplace. Um, this is, in, in many ways, a formalized version of the conversation that's been going on a lot uh, in the industry this day. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about training and our efforts, uh, hard, dedicated efforts, uh, to developing uh, a better way to train workers to address the safety issue. But I, I just wanted to note, before I talk about the Telecommunications Industry Registered Apprenticeship Program and Warriors for Wireless and PCI's education initiatives, um, it's not surprising that uh, all three of those things and many more initiatives in the industry began as conversations. Uh, uh, there's a, a great story that the uh, apprenticeship program began as, as two uh, longtime colleagues and even longer friends uh, sitting down and talking about how they were just upset about what they were reading in the news and upset at what they were seeing in the industry and how they wanted to act not just to address it for their own companies but how to make an impact across the entire industry. And it began with that conversation. It began with, you know, notes on the back of a napkin uh, and then expanded from there. They called a colleague and they called a friend who then called another colleague and called another friend. Uh, and after this panel today, uh, I'm, I'm proud to be part of something that, is, that we see as real action, a real step forward in trying to address uh, this issue. And so um, the, the dialogue is ongoing, and it's, it's very important for cultivating this culture of, of safety in the industry. Um, so training has to be at the core of that. And uh, current initiatives like TIRAP have the potential to impact not only the current surge of uh, injuries uh, in the workplace, but also can prevent against them going forward. Uh, and we're very much focused on uh, both of those aspects in working on these programs. Um, training um, uh, has to have particular characteristics in order to be successful. And I think we've discussed, we've heard about a lot of them today on the panel beforehand, but there's three in particular that I wanted to focus on. Of course, there's overarching, everything is, has to be about safety, but in order to meet that safety goal, we also have to focus on quality, we have to focus on consistency, and we have to focus on uh, certification. So to begin with quality, I just wanted to note that um, quality has to do with the uh, ability of the next team going up on the tower after the team that was there, uh, up prior, uh, prior to them, excuse me, um, knowing what they're going to encounter on the on the tower, knowing that the, the quality of work done by uh, different contractors across different com uh, companies is going to be top notch, and that is going to ultimately impact safety. Uh, it has to do with consistency. Um, right now, there's uh, some I think some shorthand within the industry to describe. Um, different uh, types of pro uh, projects, different types of positions uh, within the industry, but we have to bring that all together. There has to be a common understanding uh, throughout the industry uh, of what we're, uh, what we're trying to address. Um, we have to look to uh, push out the standards and the best practices that I think that are, um, that are all too often overlooked and, uh, and make sure that they are uh, being adopted and are the common foundation for everything that we're trying to do. And, and finally, uh, training programs should provide workers with certification for their expertise and their uh, acquired skills. It was mentioned in the last uh, panel like, that workers uh, and, their, um, and their foremen and, and everybody else involved should look for a demonstration of skills, and, and we're very much focused on that. Um, we also see certification as an investment uh, in the worker. 
I, I think that uh, this is going to start a virtuous cycle. For example, to the extent that uh, a worker uh, accomplishes, like, for example, the, the TIRAP, which is a uh, Department of Labor uh, apprenticeship program, to the extent that they attain uh, a level in the TIRAP, um, it provides a career path for them going forward so they can learn more expertise. And those expertise can then be teamed up with the, the job that has to be done at hand so you know you have the right person for the right job. And it also provides career paths so that folks who are invested in training and invested in safety are going to be able to advance. And so what is a, a worker who is uh, very focused on safety can soon become a foreman who's inv invested in safety and the safety of his team. It can become the uh, uh, company owner who is invested in safety in the team and uh, really raise uh, the bottom up uh, of all the folks involved in the industry. Um, it's going to take each and every one of us, and I think we all recognize that, and I think this is a good opportunity where we can uh, come up with a path forward in order to do that. So um, I think I'm going to be, uh, talk about it a little bit more, uh, and I'm sure you're going to hear some, some great discussions uh, later on from uh, Scott Kisting and Jonathan Adelstein to talk about the Registered Apprenticeship Program, uh, which is a, a public-private partnership. It really is all aspects coming together uh, to... Uh, come up with a, a, a solution for clear training, for clear standards, for, for safety protocols, uh, uh, and uh, it really is a, a reflection of, of all folks, government and industry, working together. Um, for PCIA's part, we uh, very much responded to President Obama's call to, to leverage the uh, extensive and fantastic education system that we have out there, community colleges, technical schools, uh, universities. And we see this as another opportunity in order to uh, bring education and training and also to recognize the skills that are developed by these workers out on the job every day so that uh, not only are uh, they are, are seeing in uh, positive investment uh, in the work and the learned skills and the on-the-job on training that they're getting, but it also it's something they can take with them to the next job. It's something that they can use as a foundation to advance themselves in their careers. So with that, um, I think that we agree wholeheartedly that the, the status quo isn't working. And, and I think that the commitment of all the folks at, at this table and the commitment especially from the folks uh, at the table before us is to address that. And I think that the TIRAP announcement this afternoon is that first step. But we're ready to take the next step. And, and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Jonathan. John? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. And, and I thank you you both for the discussions we've had as we uh, prepared for this this uh, this meeting today. Um, I think the, the first panel brought up many significant issues and problems that nobody in, in this room can avoid. Uh, we can't avoid it as a large EPC contractor. Uh, the carriers can't avoid it. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, the uh, uh, the workers that execute um, the activities to, to build the infrastructure uh, can't avoid it as well. Uh, there's a couple things that we, we look at both reactively and proactively. We know that, that fall fatalities are the leading cause of, of deaths in this industry. And if you take construction as a whole, that is the leading cause of deaths in construction as an industry as well. So that issue has been prevalent for, for some time, uh, not just in the telecommunications business, but across the realm of construction. So what do we do about it? <clears throat> we can train, we can educate, we can enforce, we can work collaboratively as uh, organizations from contractors to owners and clients to regulators to, to do the right thing. That's what this meeting is about today, is that first real collaboration. And, and I appreciate the opportunity that you provide Black and Veatch to participate in that. We've been working with Todd and, and, and Nate members uh, for well over a year. Uh, and, and it wasn't as a result of a fall or a, or a catastrophic injury to one of our workers or one of our contractors. It was we hit a threshold within our organization that it was just unacceptable. We had too many injuries, period. We had too many near misses. We had too many property damage cases. And we came together and, and asked Nate to come visit us uh, and their board of directors and said, what are we going to do as an industry? We can do all that we can do with our programs, policies, procedures, and training. And I'm very proud 
of those uh, representing Black and Beach and our subsidiary companies, that we do a lot of very good things. But you have a lack of consistency um, across the board um, uh, in this industry. So how do we do that? You have to affect change. So we, we work with Nate. Uh, we went to the symposium in Dallas last year with carriers and providers and uh, tower um, owners and, and contractors. Uh, and a lot of good things have happened. There's two other significant things. The, this fine work that, that, that you guys have done is, is extremely exciting to be celebrated today. Uh, but there's other standardization things that are, that are happening uh, along with the, the ANSI uh, committee that, that hopefully will get that standard moving in the right direction here shortly. But standardization of, of not just how you train people, uh, but the skills training that's correlated with the safety training, which is the huge miss. Um, us, along with other contractors, focused on a couple things. Is we'd spend 40 hours plus training people on safety. They get competent climber, RF awareness, first aid, CPR, rescue, all that stuff. But we realized we never trained them how to do their jobs. It would never validated that they know how to do their jobs. And so we've we've devised a new training program that could be ser that can serve as a model consistent with other activities uh, to help remedy that that particular issue. And I'll, I'll close on this: is is the 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 leading indicators show that there's something coming in this industry that that maybe some of you haven't experienced or seen, and it's the the lifting equipment that's being used, the capstan hoists that are being used. Uh, to, to bring this infrastructure up the towers and put in place. They're not being used correctly. They're being used improperly. Uh, but more importantly, it's a simple tool, but there are some complexities to it, and folks don't know how to use it. So how are they being trained on how to use the capstan hoist, how to rig, how to tag, all those types of things? And then last but not least is there's new technologies. Uh, there's a, a video that, that I provided. I don't know if we're going to show it or not. Uh, but it's the use of drone technology. Um, and, and drones can help keep people on the ground. I know that the drones aren't going to hang the antennas. They're not going to turn the wrenches. They're not going to pull the cable. They're not going to do those types of things. But if we can have a drone go up and help plan this work and validate what is exactly on that tower so that the climber climbs once, not two, three, four, five times, that type of technology needs to be explored. It needs to be utilized and can and can help in this business. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity and this gathering of people that are truly focused upon doing something in the industry. Uh, former OSHA chief. Edwin Falk had made the statement that this was the most dangerous job in America based upon a high fatality rate, I believe, in 2006. Next month we'll be coming out with uh, statistics in regards to how many elevated workers there are in this industry or a respected study that we've done. That number's always been a moving target, so we really and truly don't know how many there are, but I think we're going to be able to get closer, and that'll be helpful to the industry at large. Now, hopefully with those numbers, we could come out and say, well, we're no longer the most dangerous profession in the industry or in any industry. Hopefully we can say we're the safest, but even if we have one fatality, just one fatality, Kathy, it's sad. If you've witnessed, if you've known people, it's important. 2014 is going to be recognized as the year when America said, enough. Enough fatalities, enough injuries. America had enough of having to watch a once strong young man who would climb almost like a ballet dance on a tower and his Next moment opportunity is having to climb from his bed to his wheelchair, which he'll do for the rest of his life. For 20 years, Nate has advocated climber safety training and initiatives that have undisputably reduced fatalities and injuries, and they're continuing to take a very active role, and I think everybody thanks them for that. The newly formed Wireless Safety Task Force said in 2014, it will develop national wireless training standards for multiple skill sets, from ground worker to a lead foreman's position. 
The Telecommunications Industry Registered Apprentice Program, TIRAP, is planning upwards, I believe, of maybe 30 different apprenticeships, from telecommunications tower apprentice to broadcast project manager. 2014 will also be recognized as the year that PCIA said enough is enough and partner with Virginia State University and Richard Bland College to assist them in administrating a recent $3.25 million grant from the Department of Labor to develop a training program for the wireless workforce. With a similar grant of $2.45 million, um, Aiken Technical College will expand its, its training program, which is already in operation which they began last year, and which has resulted in placing qualified graduates in the wireless workforce. In the first ever collaboration between OSHA and the FCC, this year, these two agencies have been quite vocal in stating enough is enough. Although the FCC has always been concerned about RF issues affecting worker and public safety, its safety enforcement authority is limited. These sessions, however, could initiate rules promulgations on their part. If they do, and if you move in that direction, industry stakeholders would most likely support you if, however, they're fully involved in the rulemaking process. Everybody's charging hard, and, it, and they're going in the right direction. But there's a conundrum. Multiple working groups have publicly stated that they are working on developing new certification and training standards. If they do, how can, they, how can a company know which standard to use, and how do they address the compliance issue if one standard is in conflict with another? Also, there has been consideration in policy developing circles that the industry needs to have more clearly defined standards regarding everything from safety structure retrofitting to microwave path alignment. Enough is enough. We've already got TIA 222G, and we've got 1019A, and we've got OSHA CPLs, and we've got other standards. We've got the Nate Tower Climber Fall Protection. Had these standards that I just mentioned been followed, Kathy's son would be here. Had these standards been followed, we wouldn't have had, we'd had a goose egg up there. When our industry can demonstrate that it's following these standards, and I say, Lynn, let's go again, fully charged, and have new ones out there so that we can again understand how we can better serve fellow workers. In addition, pigeonholing everything the wireless construction and maintenance community is required to do in a standard, it may be too constricting as we continue to develop additional skill sets necessary to keep up with ever-changing technologies in DAS and other areas of wireless development. What is sorely required, however, is the immediate need for continuing stackable education unencumbered by organizational conflicts and perhaps the wrangling over who will administrate it. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Art. Thank you. Um, I was asked to provide the carrier perspective and explain what uh, carriers can do to improve tower safety. I cannot speak for other carriers, but I can tell you what we've done at AT&T to create conditions that we believe enable climbers to be safer. We believe these practices, along with our comprehensive program, have contributed to our excellent safety record uh, for the past several years. We've been able to maintain our safety record during a period uh, when the annual number of jobs requiring tower climbs have increased over 600 percent. Here, there are four main themes that uh, underpin our safety program. Uh, number one, we build safety into our contracts and we align our contracts with our programmatic approach to safety. Two, 
we are deliberate in our choice of contractors. These contractors are supplemented with our TCAP program to ensure contractors are not stretched too thin. For folks that are not familiar with TCAP, it's a program for a few select vendors to train, certify, equip, and stage uh, large numbers of well-qualified first-tier tower crews. Number three, we review and validate the safety programs of our contractors. Essentially, we inspect what we expect. And four, we work with our industry partners, such as NATE and PCIA, which offer great forums to uh, create and design uh, flexible solutions. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Art. Paul? Well, um, good morning. And thanks for having me here. Um, I've been waiting f to have this conversation for about 35 years. So I have some opinions and things to share. Uh, please, please. I'm a little it, different. Please keep it to two to three minutes. Yeah, I'll do my best, <laughs> two to three minutes. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little different than the majority of the people in this room in that I did not grow up as a tower climber. Uh, I didn't grow up in the industry. I actually started uh, my uh, safety immersion in uh, 1979, which is about 35 years ago, uh, at the U.S. Air Force Safety School. And uh, so I really got my first uh, uh, exposure in the military. And I spent the majority of my career in aerospace working system safety uh, analytics and risk management. So I hope that maybe um, as we walk through these things that I can bring some other perspectives and maybe some other tool sets that um, are of value and at least for consideration. So for t this morning in my three minutes, I, I just want to speak briefly about uh, three concepts. Uh, that were somewhat touched on a little bit in the earlier panel, but the first one being empowerment, the second one being a contagious enthusiasm, and the third being collaboration. And in order to uh, do that, uh, just to share a little bit about uh, our company, and um, I, I am uh, Vice President of Compliance for American Tower. So in American Tower, we have very low accident and injury rates and have had for a, a number of years. And I'm a big believer in safety and communicating safety every time I'm able to go out and touch an audience. So in doing that, uh, often I'm asked, so guys, what is, what's the secret? How do you guys have such low accident injury rates? And of course, a lot of people think, well, it's because you don't have any employees that, that work on towers. But that's not true. We do. We have hundreds. We have several hundred employees that are climbing towers every day. So we have the same level of exposures that you do. Um, I used to say that uh, our secret is empowerment, that every one of our employees, you, you mentioned earlier respect, respect of the, the person, of the tower climber. Um, that is a key concept with us, is that we respect the tower climber. We empower them to make decisions. We empower them to not enter an engagement on a, a tower or on a um, situation like your son did. Every one of our tower climbers know they have the ability to stop, to just stop at any point in time, which in the risk management world is a pretty important concept. If I'm driving down the interstate highway, I was, drop, I was driving down the interstate highway last night with Jonathan coming back from Dulles, and I'm doing risk calculations in my mind. I'm a terrible backseat driver, and I'm thinking the whole time, with every movement Jonathan's making, our probability of injury is shifting. So I'm terrible. I have to keep my mouth shut or I drive him crazy. But you have to always, you know, inculcate risk, risk management into your everyday thinking. And I just want to tell you a really quick little story about something that happened uh, a couple years ago. Um, we had one of our tower crews that was driving south on I-95, and they, uh, as they were driving by, they saw a a uh, tower crew that was free climbing on a tower just off the interstate. So our crews are engaged and empowered to take action. So they immediately exited, rolled back to the site, went on the site, pulled them off the tower, threw them off the site. Good job. Maybe saved somebody's life. So then they're closing it up as they close the gate. Just one little problem. They, oops, realized. It's not an American Tower site. <laughs> Whoops. 
So if they called me immediately, and they were a little you know, concerned because they're, they know they're empowered. They know we have their back. But that might be a little bit. That might be a little bit uh, over the top. So the interesting thing was is the tower site actually belonged to one of our key competitors. So immediately I got on the phone with my counterpart, with that competitor, and said, hey, um, you just need to be aware that this is what's happened, and I'm calling to inform you. And um, so there was just a slight pause, and then a res the response was, thank you. And, you know, maybe we should start doing this for each other. Pretty significant point in my life, in my business life here, in trying to protect workers, is to say, oh, wait a minute, you mean our competitors are willing to work with us to make this happen? It's like, fantastic. Well, that has grown to where now I can tell you the, the prime infrastructure owners, owners of the towers, now we compare notes. Just this past week, something came to me that was a new um, something, something. I didn't even know what it was. That was a method to build a portable work platform on a tower. Well, rather than me just looking at it, it to me it didn't, didn't look too good. But, you know, I didn't know. I don't know. So I reached out to my counterparts and my competitors and said, guys, have you ever seen anything like this? Is this a safe installation? Is this something we can use? Immediately. I got feedback from both that said, oh, well, let me give you some data here. Let me give you some data there, which allowed me to be able to say, stop, stop, that key word, stop. No, we're not going to do it. It's not a safe way to do business. Shut it down. So that's a key element. So when we talk about that third element, that the, well, contagious enthusiasm, number one, we have to be enthusiastic about what we do. We have to have life in us. We have to have an energy to make these things happen. And the third element being the collaboration. What I just described to you with one competitor and then all of our infrastructure competitors is really what we're doing here today is based on that same premise of sharing, collaborating, aligning, and working together with a passion against a common enemy. And that common enemy is who? It's the shadow of death. It's serious injury. It's harm to our soul. And we have to fight that. The reality of it is, in this group here, and all these faces, we have the intelligence, we have the tool set, we have a true contagious passion. If you don't believe it, talk to each other at break time. We have a contagious passion. And you know what? We are empowered. We are empowered to affect and sustain change for our industry through our collaboration today and beyond. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. And brief remarks from Todd before we get to some questions. <laughs> Everybody for this forum, I'd like to also thank the FCC and Department of Labor and OSHA. Um, Twenty years ago, uh, approximately 60 contractors got together and uh, formed the National Association of Tower Erectors. We are getting ready to celebrate our 20th anniversary this February. And the passion I see in this room today and the the what the synergies that are existing among the panel certainly gives gives all of us should give all of us optimism that this is another milestone date in this industry and um, so we have been providing safety standards and best practices resources for the last 20 years to help companies create a culture of safety within their own company and that first panel uh, it was emphasized time and time again, but there's no substitute for creating a culture of safety within each organization, within each company, in every layer of the chain. Uh, over the course of the past 20 years, Nate has had an outstanding working relationship with, with government entities, um, a longstanding relationship with OSHA that culminated in a national partnership for a time. Um, and... Uh, that has been a very good thing for the industry because we have been able to work with OSHA and educate them on the unique challenges associated with 
wireless infrastructure. This is not general construction. We all know that in this room. And so we've enjoyed that uh, relationship with OSHA. We even did a tower climbing training course this summer with OSHA officials, and the two OSHA representatives put us all to shame. So I think they could go to work Monday. <laughs> but um, it was alluded to briefly by pre other panelists, but uh, about a year ago, Nate assembled uh, what we have called a wireless industry safety task force. And this is a group consisting of the five largest wireless carriers in the United States, the three vertical real estate tower companies, all of the prominent large GCs and OEMs, and then the small contractors represented by Nate. And uh, what I'd like to do just briefly is highlight some of the initiatives we're going on that are very innovative and uh, will certainly achieve, I think, what we're all trying to accomplish here in sustainable safety solutions long term. Uh, we are, are working on a national wireless training standard and a governance structure that will certify the industry to that standard. standard. So the industry is going to have incredible choices, when it, whether it be the TIRAP program, the, the VSU program, the national wireless training standard. We've worked hard over the course of the last few months to make sure we're trying to sing off the same song sheet. So whatever avenue you select, you're, you're being trained to that standard. Uh, we have assembled a manufacturing and engineering solutions working group that is working with equipment manufacturers, carriers, and uh, other industry uh, stakeholders to work on developing a prototype smart lanyard system where a climber literally would not be able to tie off without the other one, it, it would preclude a timer, a climber from not from being tied off at all times because of the smart chip technology. And we've assembled the brain power with this group to make that happen. So we're excited about that initiative. We're also working with the structural manufacturers to talk about what can we do to increase the anchorage, engineered anchorage points on structures. Um, all of these conversations are ongoing and the common denominator, again, is the synergies and the collaboration existing among all the entities involved in this industry. So I look forward to uh, answering your questions and thank you for having us. Well, thank you, Todd. And uh, everyone has a lot to say on this subject. And so we're going to now segue into some questions and we would encourage all of the panelists to try to be brief and not necessarily answer every question. So one question I want to start off with, and part of you know this, this, this panel is to focus on specific best practices that can be identified and adopted across the industry, you know, the brass tacks of how we're going to actually improve safety. So some entities are using a very specific risk assessment tool that is climb specific, job specific, in which the climber and the climber supervisor have to look at that particular job and think about what are the risks that that job entails, what are the weather conditions on that day, how old is the structure, how much work needs to be done, and the like. And that it develops a specific risk assessment checklist that is signed by that climber and is supervised by the climate supervisor before anybody climbs a tower. And that includes a risk assessment on the day of the climb that would include how is that climber feeling that day? Has he driven all night to that climb? Is he fatigued? And the like. Is that a best practice that should be adopted across the industry and would it be effective in reducing the number of fatalities? So I throw that open. For that one, we're going to throw that open to everybody. Who would like to answer that question? Craig? Um, I believe OSHA dictates that you do that, and, and you could be cited under the general duty clause because as a contractor, you're required to uh, absolutely do, do that, to make sure that you provide a safe workplace for all of your employees. Now, there have been a number of people that are using a, um, a JSA over the years. An example, on Wireless Estimator, we have a number of JSAs, whether it's a civil or an elevated work JSA, and over 120,000 jobs in America were rolled in the last 12 months using those JSAs. Now, I'm not stating how many people actually used them or just checked them off. I think the, the important best practice would be that, that there's assurance that people are looking at these JSAs and they're identifying things that may not be on there and they take it seriously. Um, also, getting back to standards, 1019A standard has a JSA in there that you're supposed to use. Uh, 
I was with a working group that we created a JSA, which we thought was the best practices JSA, which included the 1019. But I, I, I believe it's important to do that, and the biggest proviso, however, is make sure it's a group effort, make sure there's a buy-in from everybody. I'll give you a couple quick data points. In NASA, this is a, uh, it's been a long-standing practice for many, many years, and uh, they don't call it a JHA, um, they call it a, a pre-test briefing, a different name. Um, in the world of DOT, another uh, statistical measurement of its value is in the uh, late 80s to early 90s in uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation. We were experiencing about uh, 15 fatalities a year on average. Horrible. And um, the corrective action in addressing that problem was forcing what they termed as tailgate meetings, which were JSAs, documented JSAs, which turned that 15 fatality per year number into one fatality every 18 months. Uh, substantial change. We can do the same. Okay, thanks. Another question for the panel. Paul brought up an interesting issue with the Stop Work Authority, and a number of people on the first panel raised issues with worker empowerment and fear of reporting problems and so forth. Uh, should we should we have uh, right to stop work authority for every climber in the industry? That's unquestionable. Absolutely. Uh, and, and if you look at uh, the industry, and, and there's several uh, fine employers uh, in this industry that you know some represented on the first panel uh, that, that dictate that you know you have stop work authority if things aren't right whether it's a weather condition a, uh, another working condition etc you have the authority to stop work uh, or, or at least to to to, um, to come down or or readjust your work plan and I think that ties with the the JHA or JSA or, or the, the pre-planning tool that was another softball question everybody knows that that's a big deal uh, the, the problem is, do people do it? Yeah. And, and you know, the, the techniques on how you how you become safe and maintain safety and improve safety are, are not new. There's nothing that needs to be reinvented here. It's executing the proven practices that have proven themselves over time, and that is having the time to plan your work, and giving the stop work authority is is critical. And if a, if a tower climber um, stops work because of whatever condition he or she felt was, was uh, concerning. And if they get fired for that, I, I have a hard time understanding what would be in somebody's mind uh, to use that as a, an enforcement tool when somebody exercised their right to stop work. I mean, th th there's no room for that in our business. And when the carrier or a black and beach of the world or a tiered contractor sees that, hears that, experiences that, they have to make it a big deal and, and change that behavior. Culture change takes time. It takes effort. Um, but everybody having the, the ability to stop work, everybody planning their work uh, is the ideal. But we are, we are many, many steps from that. This is a question for Art. One of the risks that's been identified in this, in this industry has been excessive subcontracting, that you know, the, the big players that are represented in the room here today, they're the ones that are doing it right. But at the, you can move this work from a wireless carrier down to a turf vendor, down to a smaller vendor, ultimately down to somebody that could just be working with themselves and want their employee out of the back of a pickup truck. AT&T has taken um, some steps to discourage excessive subcontracting and address that specific risk. How has AT&T that, done that, and what, and what are the lessons that can be learned for the rest of the industry? Well, it's, it's not so much that we're discouraging subcontracting. It's that we have a, um, I guess, a portfolio of, of options, and we use which is, is best for the, for the, for the situation. So at one extreme, we have employees that, that, that climb towers. They've been climbing towers for over 50 years, and I'm not aware that we've ever had a fatality at AT&T with an employee, uh, tower climber. Um, secondly, we have uh, contracts with uh, direct contracts with vendors for tower crews, not subcontracting, and we have over 5,000 uh, tower climbers available to us. At, at the first tier level from our turf vendors, from other contractors that we are, have direct contracts with. And then uh, you mentioned the, the subcontracts. Then at that level, uh, we, we allow it, but we hold our, our 
first tier vendors accountable for those subcontractors and anything that the subcontractor does uh, is reflected on on the first tier uh, vendor and, and we hold them accountable for it. What does that mean? accountable. How do you incentivize safe work and how do you penalize unsafe work? Liquidated damages in our contracts that, that come into play when there's an, uh, an unsafe condition. We regularly review the um, safety programs of, of each of our vendors and um, we, if, if an unsafe practice is being done, we can, re we can and do remove work from the vendor. That, that, that's a very um, powerful incentive there. Uh, we also remove vendors completely from, from our program, and we also impose stand downs for uh, when uh, conditions warrant for an unsafe practice. And, and if I may as well, um, I, I think we recognized uh, working with the TIRAP board um, this issue as well. And one of the things that is the goal of the registered apprenticeship program is that as folks uh, proceed through the apprenticeship and they gain this, this Department of Labor uh, credential, that is something that attests to the skills gained by the people um, who've uh, completed all the steps uh, required to become a telecommunications tower technician or something further up the career ladder. And so as contractors look down at contractors, that's something that can be pointed to as a, as a uh, uh, something that attests to the skill and it's the, the right skill set for the job at hand. So it's, it's another factor, it's another something that someone uh, can look at throughout that entire process to make sure that the companies that they are contracting with are, um, are the right company for the job. I uh, ask one for Paul. Uh, I heard a lot this morning about uh, towers that have increasing numbers of equipment mounted on them. Uh, I understand that a lot of the equipment is that uh, towers are, are approaching their design life and their design capacity. Uh, what kind of best practices would you recommend for getting out and making sure that all of these towers are inspected regularly, configured properly, ready for the new equipment that we're demanding of it? Well, the first way I would address that is to say realize that the way that we grow as uh, infrastructure companies, tower owners in the business is typically through acquisition of towers from other people, right? So towers that we built, I don't have a lot of concerns about. <laughs> towers we buy, I do at times. And I think one of the things that's important just as a best practice is if you go out and do a large acquisition, you need to re readily get feet on the ground could be looking at every one of those towers, understanding what you have, and there may be some you need to just take them down uh, because they may not be practical for sustaining. Um, when I look back at, at the way that we operate, and, and I don't have clear visibility into how everybody else operates, so I have to kind of talk about the way we work. We, what we've done, we've invested in a, an extremely large engineering group of you know, over 100 engineers that, but consider the amount of assets we have, you know, but still maybe not enough engineers. We have a lot of engineers that every day their job is assessing these towers. So we have engineering in, uh, inspections that occur on a regimented timeline. We have uh, towers being evaluated from a maintenance perspective every time we visit and touch those towers. Our philosophy is that uh, you know, these are like big erector sets. So if you have a piece that's uh, deteriorating or, or broken or damaged, it's inherent upon you if you're in this for the long haul and you're in it to be a good neighbor to your community and if you're in it to protect the workforce, you fix it. You just go fix the problems and it's a continuous cycle. And has that happened before? Another analogy I'll use is uh, when I first went in the Air Force, I worked on B-52 bombers. They were built, they started building them in 1952, and they stopped building them in 1962. Uh, that, so the interesting thing about that is, do you think there are any B-52 bombers still flying in 2014? When they were first built, I think they had a, a projected lifespan of 20 years, 62 to 82. So in theory, in 82, they were all gone away. So you think any are flying today? Yep. And right now, the projection is that the B-52s will continue flying until 2045, after I'm dead. So they were there before I was born, and they'll be there after I was dead. What's the secret there? The secret is that very thing. It's constant maintaining, constant structural analysis, constant engineering review, 
and constant replacement of, of parts that need to be replaced. There's a joke in the Air Force. I am the, I'm just going to read this. It's funny. There's a joke in the Air Force that when any given newer type of uh, bomber is retired to the boneyard, the last crew who drops off that aircraft at davis Motham Air Force Base in Arizona will be picked up in a B-52. <laughs> and there's more than a, a grain of truth to that. So it's uh, the philosophy that's used there is the same philosophy we try to use and what I would recommend to the industry. From other panelists, is that as the as de the carriers deploy 4G devices, there's more strain being put on the towers. And some of the incidents that have occurred this year have been horrendous incidences involving individuals that were tied off. They were tied onto the tower, and yet they were killed either by the tower collapsing or by steel swinging around on the tower. When is an engineering presence needed on the job site? And is it a lack of engineering presence or an act lack of adequate engineering review that's leading to some of these? Uh, fatalities involving towers not falling off the tower but being hurt by the tower itself or by the tower collapsing. Perhaps, Todd, you're the right person to answer that. Thanks for the question, Michael. What, what I can tell the audience and the other panelists is this is an issue we hear about a lot. You know, you know, we hear feedback from the climbers directly who are out there every day doing this work at elevation. And uh, it's one of the concerns, pressing concerns right now, um, I saw a presentation where uh, the, the, the LTE equipment, of course, the antenna panels are larger. It was, they estimate, this manufacturer estimated it's 24%, the RRUs that are placed up, up there, 24% heavier than the, than the 3G equipment. So right there, that, that's the first challenge from a structural perspective. Second of all, it creates a more challenging environment for the climber when it comes to navigating the tower. You alluded to it in your question, Michael. So that's a concern. So that's why we're engaging in these discussions about engineered anchorage points and other tie-off points. So that certainly is, is a concern out there in the industry. I do believe that standards exist to address those issues. I think the industry needs to do a much better job to educate the stakeholders on the TIA 1019, you know, the structural standards. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is uh, Nate's been leading the charge the last five years creating a A10. It's going to be ultimately called the A1048 standard. It's going to be the first standard ever developed that encompasses the entire tower construction and maintenance industry. So everything from pre-job planning to demolition and helicopter work on the back end. And that's significant because it's going to be a one-stop shop to, to, to find the standards that apply. Right now you have the Z359 fall protection code. You have the TIA 1019 code, the 222 code from TIA. So uh, we're working with ASSE on this. They're the secretariat of that standard. When it's, when it's complete, we're hoping sometime next year, it's going to be a resource the entire industry needs to utilize. And every contractor should have a copy of that in their trucks. Just a question for you. Uh, you know, we've heard about the smart lanyards. Uh, Paul was talking about a platform that he'd never seen before. Did, do you see any other kind of innovative things on the horizon here, technologies that might help improve the safety of the work? Uh, well, we were just talking, or you were just talking about drones, which has a possibility. Um, engineered attachment points could be an option on, on towers so that, uh, so that we know that we, we have the capability of tying off safely, that it meets the requisite number of pounds in tying off. Having said that, do we really need to have a climber look for a yellow button? I mean, they should be able to identify that themselves. But, it, but it's an option, and I think everything that we do is, is, is helpful. So you've got engineered tie-off points, if perhaps we could even talk about systems to be developed around monopoles to make it safer for our men and women to work because that is where there's a bulk of work that's being done and to traverse around a monopole is the most difficult task because you've got one, basically you've got climbing pegs maybe on two sides and that's it. So um, there are a lot of, uh, there was mention of uh, a, um, uh, using digital uh, equipment so that you could be warned about tying off. I know there's a couple patents that are being explored right now uh, for using that. And these are all wonderful tools, but as Todd just said, 
we have some standards out there, and if they were followed, like on the 1019 standard, you were mentioning about the capacity levels. Capacity is a big concern of American Tower of everybody because even though they may have built great towers in the past, they may not have anticipated that they had great salespeople who have put four tenants on them, and now that we have to do a lot of retrofitting. And so if, if we don't follow the 1019 standard, which, by the way, would have prevented the fatalities that you're talking about. If we would have followed that, we wouldn't be here today discussing those particular fatalities. Well, if we know, if we know what the, the applicable standard should be, and the industry, if they follow them, there would not be any more fatalities, how do we ensure that everyone follows those standards? And this is a question partially for art, but also for the others. You know, in our canvassing of the industry, we've seen some entities using every tool at their disposal through their contracts to get the entities that they're contracting with to follow those applicable standards. And other entities thinking about this more as an independent contractor relationship in which they don't want to specify so much what should be done in terms of safety. How can the contracts between the entities in this industry be improved? What are the specific best practices here that we can identify and adopt to make sure that those standards are actually followed? And that's a question for all the panelists. I'll start. Um, I, I mentioned this in, in my opening, and, and a lot of folks were in the room in Dallas last fall uh, where there was a carrier who, who stood up in the room and very passionately said, you tell me what I need to do, and we'll do it. You know, if we're looking for, I hate to use the term, but standardized standards, and, and you brought up that point. <clears throat> We need to have one set of standards that applies to this industry that is ever-changing and, and adopt them as an organization individually and adopt them as an industry <clears throat> and hold true to it. And I believe the carriers will, will end their flow-downs in their contracts, will, will, will say, if you're going to do this work, you need to follow these standards, period. And if that happens, that's what we're waiting on. I think there's been a lot of things brewing over the past several years, but I think a lot of synergy the past year, year and a half, to really, you know, get off the dime on this and let's go. So I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the ANSI A1048 standard's been in development for nine years, you know, which is way, way too long. And if, if OSHA starts to develop a standard, if you could, you know, get that in nine years, I'd, I'd shake your hand. Uh, but we can do some things now, and if we all adopt them, we all care about it, and if we all adopt them, you will have some, some significant changes in not only fatality rates, but accident rates in general. I think that um, I, I agree with that. I also think that it's there are the standards out there that, that folks are complying with, and, and folks like uh, Dave Anthony's company comply with every day, and they have an, an impeccable safety record. But I think we need to go a, a level deeper than that. It's not just uh, having the standards out there. It's, it's, it's having the standard operating procedures that folks are going to know to follow, and, and that comes with uh, being instructed on them. I mean, I think someone had the anecdote yesterday that you can have, you know, a 500-page standard book, and, and if it gets, you know, it can be in the truck, but if anybody's really reading it or being taught to it. I, I think on-the-job on the training is, is going to be vital to this. I think it's something that uh, as folks uh, develop in the industry and they learn these skills and these skills are recognized, then that becomes a, a major component to being able to uh, uh, convey to all parties involved that they have the right uh, tools, they have the right uh, mindset in order to do this work. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll pick on that also. Um, we, we, at 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 t we don't just say these are the standards, follow them. We also follow up to ensure that they're being followed. We measure, monitor, report, and review uh, the, the vendor performance against, against standards, uh, specifically uh, safety. Uh, we, we review their programs on a regular basis. We look at the, the training that they're providing their their employees, their, their subcontractors, specifically what types of training, how often are they training, what are the, the results of that training. Uh, we look at the, the, the incidents that they report. They're required to report all incidents to us. Uh, in addition to the reporting that they give to us, we have our own uh, um, alternative methods of, of, of tracking 
um, that the, the incidents that are out there. So then we review what we're getting from other sources against what we're what is coming to us from our vendors to ensure uh, that, that we have accurate reporting there as well. Uh, we monitor the the amount of time that that the tower crews spend on the tower to make sure that they're not going too aggressive, and we we uh, have controls in place and and uh, we measure vendors against each other against what uh, standards as to how much we believe it should take to to uh, to do that tower work to ensure that they're not going too fast. Thank you. We're going to take one question from that came in over um, email, and this um, question I think is probably best directed to uh, Paul. This is from Clifford Wilcox of Advanced Safety uh, Pros Corporation. The most accepted training certification is the communication, in the communications industry is ComTrain Tower Climbing Safety and Rescue. Yet ComTrain is restricted from using the telecommunication towers owned by the major tower owners, the same folks demanding this level of certified training. Risk management has to incorporate the ability for this training to be conducted continuously on their own facilities. How might we, as a community and industry, work to allow training guidelines that allow uh, for training to be done on the facilities of those asking for the training? So you probably target that question to me because we don't allow training. I didn't on know our that. Towers. I didn't know that, Paul. I was well, just saying that to you, you as that's a tower truth. owner. It's a fact of life, and it is a uh, it is a risk management thing. It's shock shock. Uh, if you all remember, within the last four years, one of the fatalities that we had in our industry was a uh, training instructor that fell off a training tower. Um, we keep, I'll tell you, we, we keep tight control on our assets. That's the bottom line. We keep tight control on our assets. And we have a reputation of being very conservative. We have a reputation of um, ruling with a sword when it comes to non-compliant issues. So we, we, we take it very seriously. And um, uh, my perspective is that the uh, approach should be taken that if you're in that business to provide that service, you need to, you need to provide and maintain your own structure. I think I would just add on top of that that um, I think we recognize that. I recognize the uh, availability of quality facilities out there. And, and that's why we're teaming up with folks like VSU through the grant process so that they can develop facilities that are, are built to be the safest possible environments but give them that training at height. Um, and so you, you aren't having to, to go to an American Tower site that has all kinds of other factors that go along with that individual site. Every site is different. You have a much more controlled, learning-focused atmosphere within the uh, established uh, education system. One, just one last follow-on with that, too, is that it's better for, for the type of training that's going on to be on a static test facility rather than a live tower with live RF. That's the primary reason. Uh, we're getting pretty close to wrapping up here, but I just wanted to, to ask everybody, you know, the, you're all very major players in the industry, and, and if you would all commit yourself to working with OSHA and the FCC as we drive this process forward. Uh, you know, I mean, today's a great meeting, and I think we've all learned a lot from each other. Uh, but I hope that you'll all uh, commit to working with us as we, as we move forward on this so that we can get these best practices pushed down throughout the industry. That's a question for everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, not, not only do, uh, do I commit to, to OSHA and the FCC, but we'll, we'll commit to the uh, Employment and Training Administration. Uh, we'll, we'll commit to the Department of Education, all of which can play vital roles in improving this. And to add on that. You know, Nate is going to continue our, you know, this is only going to solidify the longstanding relationship we've had with OSHA. And I appreciate the fact that the FCC is giving it this platform because I think, you know, change can be impacted with your joint collaboration, and we appreciate that. And, and with our NAT Wireless Industry Safety Task Force, you know, I think we're going to be collaborating with both of your entities very closely. We've uh, run out of time, and so we ha now um, have a moment for brief one or two sentence uh, closing remarks. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not looking at you, Paul, for any reason in particular, but um, and then we're going to hear um, remarks from uh, Commissioner Clyburn. So um, we'll start with you, Jonathan. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Um, 
Uh, we hope that everybody uh, stays around for the TIRAP signing ceremony. This is the launch of something very special, and it's something that um, uh, PCI is looking to build upon with our education initiative. But we are looking uh, for feedback. We're looking for engagement. And it, it begins uh, – uh, it has been ongoing, and it's uh, been bolstered here today. Uh, but uh, I think that we're looking for as many perspectives to make sure that it's the right type of education and training for everybody from the tower technicians all the way up to the foremen to the, to the leaders in the companies. Thank you. I'll just address Mr. Maddox's last question. Uh, we will welcome your, your standard development team in November. So we are deeply committed to, uh, to that standard process, and, and uh, we'll continue to do so moving forward. And thank you for the opportunity today. In an earlier session, we were heard we, we heard about um, getting a buy-in from the bottom up, and, and I think that's so so important. And oftentimes we want to—I don't want to say denigrate youth, but we don't give them the respect that they should. And if a 17-year-old Pakistani girl can win the Nobel Peace Prize, then I think we have people in this industry that can help us to elevate it. One of the important things that we should consider in, in doing research, OSHA, uh, I'm sorry, Zurich, which provides coverage for the majority of major companies in this industry. They came out and just recently, and they found that there were four points that there's commonalities and why we're having injuries and fatalities. Number four was a short tenure with the employer. Number three was remote locations with low supervision. Number two was youth. And number one, they were untrained, and that's why it's perfect to have TIRAP and all these great uh, applications that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, thank you for bringing us all together. I look forward to working with, uh, with all the stakeholders, this panel, the other panel, uh, the folks out in industry to, to, uh, to um, make it a safer place for our tower climbers. Uh, everybody, depending on where they're sitting, has uh, the um, different things that they can do, that they can influence um, options or that, that they, they can take. And we need to make sure that everyone from wherever they're sitting can, uh, does engage and take those options so that we can uh, collectively uh, solve, the, solve the issue. Thank you. Commercial message and a challenge is um, I'd like to introduce you to Mill Standard 882E, which is titled Department of Defense Standard Practice for System Safety. Um, just read through it. It'll help you have a better understanding of an alternate way to analyze risk in your life and in your work. Well worth the read. This is my challenge is for everybody to read it, please. I, it'll help. It'll truly help. Uh, the only other thing is this has been great, and let's just keep talking. I have learned so much today, and I have written so many notes today that I'll go back and, you know, I will take action on these things. So let's all try to do that, okay? Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, I do believe the industry is now at the point where we can solve this issue on our own and um, with the help of our friends um, at the FCC and DOL. But, um, again, we are always going to strongly advocate for creating that culture of safety internally, and, and um, every layer of the chain is responsible for that. And I was heartened to see that that came out loud and clear in both panel sessions today. So thank you, everybody, for uh, participating. And thank you, everyone. This has been a terrific discussion. We hope it produces significant and um, concrete results, and we look forward to working with you all uh, going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll have a few brief words from FCC Commissioner Clyburn. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Mrs. Pierce and Mrs. Hester, I join you and other participants today because I believe that this workshop represents a significant and positive step towards improving the safety of those workers who build and maintain our wireless infrastructure. Chairman Wheeler and Secretary Perez are to be commended for addressing this issue in such a proactive way. Our wireless networks are expanding at an amazing rate, 
and we are meeting the critical information needs of our nation like never before. Even with these enormous benefits, however, we must never lose sight of those who build these networks and the dangers that they face. They are often young, some are relatively inexperienced, and others are not represented by unions. So collectively, we have a responsibility when it comes to their safety. According to some reports, the fatality rates for tower climbers are as high as 10 times the rate of the general construction industry. I am aware of the toll is taken on my state. Where in June of 2007, a 30-year-old tower technician fell 140 feet from a tower in Bluffton, South Carolina. And in that same month, a technician fell 170 feet from a tower in Somerville, South Carolina. That young technician was Mrs. Kathy Pierce's only son. And while I know this is difficult for you, we are grateful that you are here with us today sharing your comments about the loss of Tad and for dedicating yourself to raising awareness about the dangerous workers face in the telecommunications industry. One tower worker fatality is one too many. Our goal is and should be that no more families have to suffer the way that these two families have. To get to zero will require 100% of the effort from 100% of those in this room to build the safety systems we need from wireless companies to service providers to tower companies, 100% of the power and 100% of the tools to achieve 100% safety. I have been impressed with OSHA's efforts to meet these goals. In his February 2014 letter to the communications tower industry, Dr. David Michael sent a strong message that since 2012, we have seen an unacceptable increase in tower worker deaths. As he put it, Every one of those deaths was, unprevent was preventable, and a high proportion of those deaths were due to inadequate fall protection. He reminded how workers em worker employees of their obligation to provide employees with appropriate fall protection, and the employer must consistently supervise and enforce the use of such protection. Last month, OSHA sent another strong message to the tower worker industry when it proposed a fine of more than $134,000 against a wireless construction company for several willful and serious safety violations. These actions demonstrate how serious OSHA is at achieving a 0% fatality rate. As it's discussed today, we need to develop new and innovative tools for identifying and addressing specific risk. It may be that we need a sign-before-you-climb approach that assesses climber-specific and job-specific risk at each job site in advance and on the day of the job before any worker climbs a tower. It may be that we need to rethink the safety provisions in the contracts between wireless companies and service vendors. And we may need to keep regulatory options on the table. All of these options must be a part of the conversation going forward. The collaboration between the Commission and the Department of Labor that resulted in this workshop is to be applauded and continued. I also appreciate the wireless industry's willingness to work in a positive way with the Commission and the Department of Labor and strongly encourage the industry to continue this productive engagement. I would like to join others here today in thanking all of the panelists speakers, workshop organizers, and specifically the Wireless Bureau for making this extremely important workshop possible. Thank you very much. We will now take a short break. Um, if you don't want to wander too far, we will be starting um, the remarks before the signing ceremony at noon promptly. So we get back by noon.
Could all the speakers and the TIRAP members that are participating in the sign signing ceremony please come forward? Could everybody take their seat, please? We're going to get started. Could everybody please take their seat? So now to start off the uh, remarks and the signing ceremony, I'd like to introduce FCC Commissioner O'Reilly. Well, thank you all. I, I appreciate it. I was going to – I have a – a joke all lined up, but I happen to have the opportunity today to watch the panel from my office, and it, it's anything but a joking matter to hear from the families, to talk about what has happened in their experience and lost loved ones, and also to hear from the panelists and talk about how these issues are so important. And it's not necessarily a changing of uh, training per se. It is about uh, compliance, and it's about uh, following protocols, and it's about making sure that the employees are well trained in the first place. So it's a it's a it's an appreciative opportunity that I'm here to to speak before you. We do know that the demand for uh, towers and antennas and alterations and modifications are going to only increase. And we have a number of things that we've been doing here that is only going to add to the workload from our AWS auction, which is going to be uh, starting next month, 600 megahertz uh, scheduled for some time next year, the number of small cells that are going to proliferate throughout America. And then we see what future investments that carriers are making uh, and new providers are going to make in this space. So we're very aware of the work that we're adding to this space, and, and it's going to be important important that it be done in a thoughtful and creative way. I only was uh, asked to speak for a minute, but my important function is not just the comments I made, but actually to introduce the next speaker. That is uh, Scott Kisting of the TIRAP organization who is going to talk about the apprentice program and his work with that. He has served since February 2011 as the Senior Vice President for, RIC, for Risk and Compliance for Midwest Underground Technologies Incorporated. 
Throughout, through, uh, through more than his 25-year career, he served as a subject matter expert for the OSHA Training Institute and starting, started his career in the telecommunications industry, climbing, erecting towers, and installing network-related equipment. Thank you all, and I want to welcome Scott to the table. Thank you, Commissioner, for the kind words and everybody else that's been able to attend. You know, as you look around this room, you prepare a speech and you want to use what you prepare, but then you have to look at the talent assembled and the genuine concern of the people. So as I talk to you, please remember, this isn't about an individual. This is about an industry and the individuals that do the work each and every day. The members of the TIRAP board, the committee members, and all the evolved associations of ASSA convey the appreciation for the support each of you are showing, knowing that together we can create a career path for our veterans and civilian workers in the telecommunications industry. The TIRAP, or Telecommunications Industry Registered Apprenticeship Program, is a joint venture of the telecommunications industry and the United States Department of Labor. Our industry is in desperate need of skilled workers that can provide the American people with the telecommunications services we've come to expect and is currently enabling us to compete in new ways due to the efficiencies that have been gained through the use of this technology. When you think of telecommunications, it's truly moved from something that's just a luxury to necessary and essential communications. As the demand for services continue to grow, so does the need for the skilled workforce that is able to understand the scope of work the standards that do apply and are currently in place for the structure at hand to enable us to plan to do the work in the safest manner possible, ensuring that everybody has access to the system that we need. Think of it this way. We all enjoy the convenience telecommunications provides us. It's great to see the video of a cat or to send a cool picture to a dear friend. But we must realize that depending on where you are and when, 60 to 80 percent of all 911 calls come in over our wireless devices. Hold on that thought as we go through this. Through TIRAP, we are creating a career ladder for men and women that provide the build-out maintenance of this critical network infrastructure each and every day. We must do this work in a safe and quality manner. The Department of Labor has worked to create the means for the various career paths to be communicated to any employer that wants to be involved in the program. Currently, the Triple T, or Telecommunications Tower Technician, is credentialed, and we are working with the help of so many, Nate and so many others, on the foreman levels and career paths. Currently, we are working on the antenna line and structural modification foreman. Once those are complete, we will advance with in excess of 20 other career paths. Important recognition must be given to the Department of Labor and OSHA for their support and appointing members of their team to support the program. Think about this. OSHA sits as part of our board. They've taken the time to understand the problem and be truly creative in how they approach it. The FCC has invested countless hours in trying to understand how to support our industry. But it all comes down to what the board members have reminded myself and so many other individuals. We are not doing this for anyone other than the men and women that perform this work and the employers that want to invest in their people. So the next time you pick up your phone and use it for any reason, Allow the thought to cross your mind of all the people engaged in providing this service each and every day. To the American telecommunications worker, thank you for all you do each day. Please continue to do so in a quality and safe way. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jonathan Alstein. Jonathan has given the majority of his career to our industry. He served as an FCC commissioner and currently is the president of PCIA. Jonathan's concern for individuals is one of the things that ranks him about as one of the most notable people in the industry. He cares about individuals. Jonathan Adelstein. Well, thank you, Scott, and thank you for all your leadership in, in spearheading this effort and getting TIRAP up and running. Uh, and it's great to be back on this dais again. I spent almost seven years up here. But it's especially an honor to have joined with Chairman Wheeler and Secretary Perez on behalf of the wireless industry. And we thank the FCC for the outstanding workshop today. We learned a lot. A lot of very great information came out and is something we need to act on. 
It's something we are acting on. It's something we're here now at the signing ceremony to do something about, to address those concerns. So this is a special day for the hundreds of members of PCIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association. That includes our carriers, our infrastructure owners, equipment manufacturers, and service companies. We had two of our companies on the previous panel. Together we comprise the entire wireless infrastructure ecosystem. And it's a day that so many of us have worked so hard to bring about with great leadership from Scott Kisting and David Sams and all of the members of the TIRAP board. The wireless industry is working proactively to address workforce safety. We don't want to come back here again and see those kind of numbers. We want to take that down to zero. And that means we have to change what we've done. TIRAP is helping to spearhead those efforts. Our goal is to create the wireless workforce of the future with a culture of safety and a culture of quality. And TIRAP is indispensable to that effort. We're striving through TIRAP and, and other efforts to draw on the expertise of the entire wireless industry to build best of class training curricula across all facets of a workforce. Apprenticeships are really a central part of that vision. Training may begin in the classroom, but it has to continue in the field, especially in an industry like ours, where well-crafted apprenticeships, a master can teach somebody how to do it right on the job. And Chairman Wheeler has made clear, and the FCC in its entirety has made clear, that we must continue to lead the world in wireless networks. We've discussed on many occasions, the Chairman and I, who I now see has entered the room, the need for expertly trained workers to deploy, upgrade, and maintain these wireless networks. TIRAP unites leaders from across the industry, partnered with the public sector in an unprecedented effort to build that wireless workforce and to build it right. Chairman Wheeler and Secretary Perez, thank you for being here. We certainly uh, want to thank you for your forward-looking commitment to job training, for your engagement in creating this effort. We're making history together here today. This is the first time that an apprenticeship program is built not just for one company, but by and for an entire industry, not just a single entity. I think this is a model for other industries to follow. TIRAP apprenticeships will improve worker safety. They'll address the industry's need for broadband deployment. They'll provide employment and advancement opportunities through skilled base and experiential training. We're beginning with tower technicians, as we've discussed today, but next, we'll build more pathways toward much needed specialties and leadership roles. We'll open opportunities for high-skilled, well-paying jobs in one of the fastest growing industries in the world. Safety is number one on the agenda, and TIRAP draws upon the collective experience of the industry's top experts. That agenda goes even further, including technical quality, so a workforce can get the job done right. And getting the job done right the first time is a safety issue because we don't want somebody to have to go up there again and fix it or encounter problems when they're up there. Apprenticeships are just the beginning. We're leveraging America's higher educational system, including community colleges and technical schools, to expand training as well. That will provide more opportunities for the current workforce to enhance their skills and keep up to date on the latest technology. And it will also train new workers to fill roles in the industry that we need filled today. Apprenticeships, I think, will work hand-in-hand -hand with the school-based educational setting. For that, we certainly thank uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden, Secretary Perez, for their strong support of job-driven skills training that industries like ours need. I'd like to offer a special thanks to Secretary Perez for the grant we received last month from the Department of Labor for the Virginia State University and for Aiken Technical College that will provide resources that we can use to build world-class training programs and export them across the country. So we thank you for that. We're honored to partner with these institutions as the National Industry Association to develop these programs. They'll emphasize safety first, and they'll also help job, seek, job seekers gain the technical skills that they need to build careers in our industry. TIRAP and PCA are thrilled to support Warriors for Wireless as well, to make sure we can put as many veterans as possible to work in these industries. There's no better people that we want in our industry than people who have served our country and need a job when they come home. PCI's goal, as required by the grant, is to create industry consensus standard operating procedures, teach them to workers, and establish employee certification to ensure that they're implemented. We'll also establish a database so employers can track those credentials. We, we've seen what's happened here. We can't simply recycle the same old approach and expect improvement. Lives are at stake. It's time for the industry to unite and raise the quality of our training programs and protect our workforce. And we're committed to doing that. 
That's why PCI is creating an educational platform that not only addresses today's needs, but seeks to create a more professionalized wireless workforce. You'll see TIRAP's expertise and perspective throughout these programs. So we're thrilled, PCIA and TIRAP, to work with the FCC, DOL, and other stakeholders to develop more apprenticeships. We're honored to be part of Chairman Wheeler and Secretary Prez's team. So thank you for doing this today, and thanks for having us. With that, I'd like to introduce, uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Michaels, uh, Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA, somebody who's really taken a commitment to our industry, and we appreciate your leadership in making sure that our workforce is safe and uh, the great attention that you paid to our issues. Thank you. Well, well very good. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank, thank you, Scott. Um, Tire Up is a terrific program. It's going to provide creative and collaborative solutions to so many of the problems that we discussed this morning. Uh, saving workers' lives starts to make, by making sure safety is a key part of any training program. And of course, as you heard today, workers have to know not just how to work safely, but they have to have the right to stop a job when that job is dangerous. And that has to be part of these training programs, and that, that has to be a message that goes down, cascades down through the, from the carriers to the owners, to the maintenance operators, all the way down. I think that's the only way we're going to make sure these numbers go down to zero in the future. But I have no doubt that these new tower technicians trained by TIREP and the companies that employ them will provide a shiny example for the whole industry on how to perform work safely and how to make sure we don't see any more deaths. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Federal Communications Commission Chairman Tom, Thomas Wheeler. Uh, Chairman Wheeler has shown extraordinary hospitality for hosting us here to discuss these important issues, but more importantly, because of his leadership and his vision, so many of the most important actors in the industry are now involved in stopping these preventable fatalities. We are grateful for his deep involvement. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Michaels, and um, welcome, uh, Secretary Perez. We're um, so grateful. Uh, for, first of all, it, you know, uh, David Michaels gave a nice credit to us, but let's let the facts speak for themselves. I believe it was OSHA that contacted uh, Roger Sherman. It was you, David, who contacted Roger Sherman and says, hey, we've got to do something about this. So we really appreciate you calling this to our attention. We, I also want to say a call out to uh, to Kathy Pierce and... Bridget, I saw you here a moment ago. We met in the hall. There she is, hanging back in the back, Bridget Hester, um, for their difficult but important witness to how personal the tragedies that we're trying to stop are. And we really appreciate both of you being here uh, today. Uh, for all of you who participated in the workshop, um, thank you. Um, Secretary Perez was over here in the corner, and we were kibitzing a minute, a minute ago, and he says, everybody who counts is here. And I said, yes, that's right. And that's the significance about what is happening uh, here today. We, we often say, you know, that here at the FCC we're building um, the future. And today, that's more than a metaphor, because we are talking about building the future, because the future is wireless, and wireless creates opportunities, both in terms of what it enables and in terms of the economic opportunities that it provides for individuals. So if there are 10 to 15,000 people out there who earn their living building the infrastructure that will be the pathway for the 21st century. We need to make sure that that pathway is being constructed safely for those workers and with, with those workers. I have a huge respect for the job they do. In fact, I was telling Secretary Perez, I may actually have a unique respect for what they do because between college, uh, between high school and college, I had a job high up in the Andes in Ecuador and there was a radio antenna that went up for hundreds of feet and I was sent up to change the aircraft warning bulb on the top. And I start climbing up 
And I get about 50, 60 percent up, and I say, I can't do this. And I chickened out and went back down. But I have personal experience. <laughs> I can feel it in my gut, literally, when I think about it. The, 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 the kind of focus, the kind of attention that, that these individuals uh, have to engage in um, on their job. And, and my respect is, is quite real. But the problem is that far too many of these hardworking individuals have had the amount of training that I had before I started climbing up. And they, it's on-the-job training. And today, the industry and government come together to do something about that. This chart is awful. And this has to be the last time we see a chart like this. Fatalities like this result from breakdowns in safety systems. We must move beyond OJT. We must identify the risks and mitigate them. We must train and inspect and train and inspect and train and inspect to make sure that this infrastructure is safe. The tower erectors and their clients, the carriers, have come together to start this process. Thank you to all of you for your identification of the issue and your willingness to step up and deal with it. Thank you to PCIA, to CTIA, to CCA, to Nate for stepping up and working th with your industry organization to do something about this. And today's workshop was a manifestation of that. But it's my privilege to now introduce the Secretary of Labor, Tom Perez, because working with the Department of Labor and with the industry, we have, as you have heard, put together the Telecommunications Registered Apprentice Program, TIREP, to be innovative, and to be voluntary, but to deal with the training challenges and the safety, therefore the safety issues that we all have agreed today have to be confronted. So thank you uh, to, uh, to Dr. Michaels for your leadership on this, and it's my privilege to introduce the Secretary of Labor, Tom Perez. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here with you, and uh, uh, Chairman Wheeler, thank you for your kind words, and thank you for your leadership. This is a great partnership, and I look forward to continuing that partnership. And again, I also want to say um, thank you to, um, to Kathy and, and to Bridget, because uh, this is all about you. This is all about the fact that uh, the most important thing for any worker in America, when he or she leaves in the morning, is to make sure they come home at night safe and sound. That's what it's all about in every single workplace across America. And that's what brings us here uh, together as industry, as, as consumer groups, as, as, as um, the federal government working together as one, solving problems. Uh, that's what it's all about. And I want to say thanks to my colleague, David Michaels, who is the head of OSHA, because uh, I remember meeting with David um, a while back, and what alarmed me the most was that there were two fatalities in 2012. That's two too many. And then we see the numbers uh, off to my left, 13 in 2013. And uh, the trend lines are not what we want to see. And I want to say thank you to David for calling attention to this. And, and thank you to Tom and his team, because we are indeed all in this together. And thank you to our industry partners who are here, because this meeting is indeed unprecedented. And our goal is to not fix the blame, but to fix the problem. And the way to fix the problem is to get all the stakeholders around the table, the expertise that you bring to bear, the expertise that we bring to bear, 
the reminder day in and day out that this is about real people whose lives have been affected. And, and your presence here, the importance of it cannot be overstated. Thank you for traveling here today. Thank you for giving voice to this issue. And then making sure we bring together all of what we have to bear uh, in the federal government. And it starts with safety, because safety is indeed job one at every workplace in America. And here, it continues with the fact that we have an industry that is growing. And that growth is great for America. I mean, the, the ways in which the work that you do has transformed lives is, is just too numerous to mention. The opportunities that are out there for people to get a level playing field as a result of having access to technology those are making the world smaller. Those are expanding opportunity for people, whether you live in rural uh, or urban or exurban America. All of these opportunities are remarkable. And so the challenge before us is as we see this exponential growth, and exponential growth is sometimes hyperbolic, but I don't think it's hyperbolic in this context. The growth is very real. We have to come to grips with certain realities. And the reality on the safety front is that tower workers are currently 10 times more likely to die on the job than the average construction worker. And if we, do don't, if we don't do something about this now, those figures are going to rise. And I am confident. Our goal here is to make sure we move to zero fatalities. And that is what we are going to benchmark ourselves against. That's what we're going to hold ourselves to. And I am confident that we can get there because we have know-how at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. We have experience in other industries where we saw increasing and disturbing trend lines, followed by collaboration with key stakeholders, followed by the development of an effective and comprehensive plan and the implementation of that plan and the relentless oversight in that plan. I am confident that we can do it here. And that leads me to the next aspect of what we're doing because a big part of our success, as you have correctly and prior speakers have correctly pointed out, is growing the workforce, understanding what it takes to be a tower tech in the year 2014, understanding that Tom Wheeler is a great FCC chairman, but he's a lousy tower tech. <laughs> we can stipulate to that. And by the way, so is Tom Perez. <laughs> that's, and, and, and we will, and that is, that, that's my segue um, to Eric Sellis now, who is one of our senior leaders in our Employment and Training Administration, because we need to grow the pipeline of Tower Techs, and we need to make sure that they have the proper training, and we need to make sure, and that's why we have our Veterans Employment and Training colleagues here as well. We need to make sure that we provide opportunities for every worker, including but not limited to our service members who have done so much for our nation to come home and to get access to these jobs, and to make sure that these jobs have great ladders of opportunity, and pay uh, a decent middle-class wage so that we can attract the right talent. And that is why uh, coming together today is so uh, exciting for me because we are marrying the safety mission of our OSHA component with the job training and job growth mission of our Employment and Training Administration and our, invet and our Veterans Office as well. Uh, I apologize for my squeaky voice. Uh, because I just had some throat surgery about two and a half weeks ago. But I assure you that my support for this issue is full-throated. And we will continue to move forward. And that is why, uh, and, and one way we're going to move forward is that we're institutionalizing uh, this partnership. The FCC and the DOL have formed a working group with industry participation to develop these recommended practices uh, for employers. And in order to do this and make sure it's a success, we need to make sure that the safety principles are fully integrated into the worker training efforts. And that is why I am so excited to announce and sign our uh, registered apprenticeship program for Tower Techs, which again is another partnership between the Labor Department and the industry leaders uh, who are here in this room. Because TIREP will ensure that tower techs receive the training set necessary to reduce, and our goal is to eliminate uh, injury on the job, and I am excited uh, to be here with you today because I have seen apprenticeship at work in so many different 
sectors. And apprenticeship does work. Apprenticeship helps people get the necessary training they need to succeed. Apprenticeship helps people get access to good, well-paying jobs that have those career ladders and enable you uh, to feed your family and to make sure, and this is obviously job one, that when you leave in the morning, you will indeed come home at night safe and sound. And I am particularly excited about the uh, Warriors for Wireless program, which will ensure that vets have safe jobs in the wireless industry. Uh, people like um, uh, retired Command Sergeant Angel Ramos. I don't know if uh, Sergeant Ramos is here today. Uh, he was invited. I'm not sure he was. Oh, there he is in the back. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, you have a remarkable uh, future uh, in this program, and you have done so much for us and we owe it to you to make sure that you have a career ladder when you're at home. And I am confident because I've seen the numbers on this industry, the sky's the limit. And we're going to make sure that safety is job one moving forward. And so this is really a case study in partnership at work. This is a case study in folks coming together to say, you know what, let's, let's stop fixing the blame. Let's start fixing the problem. The problem here of safety in this work setting is very real. And it's also very fixable. And it's fixable with leadership. It's fixable with relentless attention, relentless oversight, a good, comprehensive plan. That's what we're going to develop. That's what we are developing. And our goal is to make sure that every single person in this industry, when you get up in the morning, you're coming home at night safe and sound with a good middle-class job, the ability to feed your family, the dignity that comes with being part of this digital revolution in which we are expanding access to opportunity across this country and really across the globe. And so this is really uh, an exciting day for me. And Chairman Wheeler, thank you uh, for hosting us. Thank you for your leadership. And our work has just begun. And every time I think about this, I will be looking at all of you and thinking about you because that is what it's about. You don't want to be here. I wish we could turn the clock back. I so wish we could turn the clock back for so many people who've lost loved ones. And the best thing we can do to pay tribute to your loved ones, to your, to your son, to your husband, is to make sure that nobody else has to join you in the future. And that's the commitment you have from me. That's the commitment you have from all of our partners in this room and in this administration. And I am confident that we can succeed and we will relentlessly focus on it because this is the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. We have a remarkable set of partners here. Let's continue to get to work. Let's sign this and let's move forward. Thank you for all of your attention and thank you for your leadership.